Welcome everyone to the Cardano Effect podcast, episode 32. The purpose of this podcast is to take high-level developer information and projects that are occurring within the Cardano space and break them down into bite-sized, consumable pieces of information for everyday use. I'm your host, Philippe, and let's get this podcast started. So we have Sebastian, Rick, and myself today. So all three hosts of the Cardano Effect are here. We missed you, Sebastian. We're glad to have you. Uh, we're going to get right into the mix of things. I just wanted to remind everyone that if you missed our previous episode, we had Robert Kornacki on, and we talked about his project, which is Sire. And we were talking about transaction surety on the blockchain, and it was a great episode. He's also the co-founder of the Rock Pi project, and he is the co-founder of Clio.one. So that was episode 31. Go and check that out. And if you're watching this episode of the Cardano Effect podcast and you like what you see or you don't like what you see, please consider subscribing. Our podcast is growing, and we'd love to have you continually follow us and support us. So we thank you for that. So with that being said, I'm going to move right into the crux of this episode. I'm going to pass the mic over to Rick. Remember that none of what we say on this podcast is financial advice or should be taken as such. You are your best financial advisor. And if you don't think you are, you need to find someone who's qualified to do so. That being said, Rick, how are you doing today? What's going on? Hi, Philippe. Hey, I'm doing great today. And thank you for asking. And I'm broadcasting from lovely San Diego still this week. And today we have Charles Hoskinson, CEO of IOHK, returning to the podcast, and also Mr. David Esser, Senior Product Manager of Cardano at IOHK, both returning to the podcast. And what I would like to do is give a shout out to IOHK, our sponsor of this podcast, and also iHeartRadio, who recently picked us up. We're also on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, SoundCloud, and our primary service provider is the Libsyn feed. So just getting that shout out out there. And so here we have Charles and David with us today. And I would like to say hello, gentlemen. Welcome back to the podcast. And the biggest question has been answered, and that is when roadmap. So how are you doing today? <laughs> We're to doing here. great. We're really yeah. glad to have that question answered too. Yeah. Well, first, congratulations on uh, getting on iHeartRadio. I think uh, I think you're on every aggregation now. Uh, is there any missing? We are. The only aggregations that we're not on is, uh, as Shoshi just pointed it out today on Twitter, is the decentralized platforms uh, like iBit uh, or something like that. So we need to make our move sometime eventually and figure those out and get on those platforms. Okay. All right. Uh, so roadmap. When roadmap. That was a big one. When shelling wed roadmap and wed ro when roadmap has been answered, it came out this week. There was It was a very nice uh, improvement to the roadmap that I saw in there. I've seen a lot of questions on Twitter where people say, um, does it show which quarter? Does it show which year? What they people may not have caught was that colored line graph on there. So maybe somewhere we would start from is uh, how did you guys construct this new roadmap. The old one was very detailed and it had three columns and you had to drill, you could drill down. There was a lot of detail and a lot of complexity to it. How did you uh, determine this simplified one? Did you hire some high-end engineer out there or did you guys no, get together no, no. a brainstorm? And I'll kind of, I'll kind of talk about the high level goals. And then since David was the, the guy who delivered most of the content and put a lot of the structure together, uh, he can take uh, particulars. Um, so, you know, a roadmap is a reflection ultimately of the philosophy of how something is built and the overall organizational knowledge and the project management system that you're following to build that thing. So when we first started Cardano, we kind of had a view of what we wanted to do. And, and a lot of this was high risk, high return and very aspirational R&D and, and development efforts. So we kind of knew where the cryptocurrency market was at. We knew where re the state of the art was research was at. We knew where the, the existing code bases were at. And we had a, a lot of knowledge from this. And then we just went out and started doing stuff. Like we developed uh, a formal specification for UTXO accounting. And then we figured out a way to make UTXO and Ethereum style accounts live on the same ledger and be able to move value between them. We figured out how to proof of stake worked. We figured out how to do side chains. We did a huge amount of research into programming language theory. And unfortunately, the old way of doing things was percentages and, and various quarters. And what ended up happening was that things that we thought were simple weren't as simple as we wanted them to be. Uh, processes that we were following, particular engineers that we were working with, just didn't turn out to be the right fit for what we were trying to deliver. And so we had to, over time, make changes. And over time, we learned basically how to deliver something like this to market. So what ended up happening was that the old roadmap uh, compared to 
the project management, the product management, the actual product delivery process had gotten out of sync with each other to an extent where things like the percentages weren't so meaningful. And it was, it was uh, more like a waterfall process uh, that we had prior. Uh, now we're more agile. So we said, let's just take a big step back. And first, let's try to simplify everything, philosophically speaking. And let's break it down into eras. And in each and every one of them has kind of a reason to exist. And it does something. So the first, obviously, was Byron, and that's saying, let's release something. Let's build a community around that. Let's get infrastructure. Let's learn how to get on exchanges. Let's learn how to write good APIs. Let's learn how to work with third-party uh, devices like uh, other wallets, Ledger, these types of things. And in the process of doing that, we're basically learning the nuts and bolts of our industry and, and how to ship products within our industry in a safe and responsible way. And furthermore, how to work with people who do ship products and make sure that there's a standard user experience and quality amongst that entire setup. And then we call that the Byron era. And it, you know, it's a very successful component. So part of a good roadmap is closing that out and explaining what did we accomplish and what was gained from that investment of time, effort, and money. Uh, and then moving forward, you go into other major milestones. So Shelley is the next major milestone, and it's uh, something everybody cares a lot about. And the, the kind of the core uh, item there is decentralization. So basically, first, we have to define that word. You say, what is decentralization? What does it mean? Because there's 500 different ways you could go about it. So what is our particular definition? And what are our high-level goals there? For example, how many stake pools do we want? And how do we decentralize the development process? And how do we decentralize decision making, et cetera, et cetera, these, these kinds of things. And then what are things that are in scope? What are pieces of technology, pieces of features that really ought to get done to make that safe and understandable? And then the next era after that is Gogan, and that's all about programmability, smart transactions, and that's the whole ecosystem. So that's where smart contracts and dApps and these things come from, and really bringing a lot of the innovation that we've been working on the last three years with Plutus and Marlowe and that whole model into the system. Furthermore, it's about extending the system. So we think a lot about, well, how do we start having the conversation about Cardano CL, which is where sidechains come into play. And then at some point, the system's going to get overloaded with lots and lots and lots of users and lots of dApps and transactions. And unless we have a scaling solution, we're going to experience the very same victim of success that Ethereum uh, uh, suffered from. So we said, well, we need some era where we're going to turn on a lot of the scalability ideas that we've developed. And that's Basho. So that's where Ouroboros Hydra comes into place and also a lot of the layer two scaling ideas. And then finally, we need to be able to hand this thing off financially speaking and control speaking to not just a federation of actors or a lot of people who've meritocratically earned a place in the community, but to basically every single person that cares. And uh, that's what Voltaire is about, is a big discussion about the treasury system and the governance system. So the way that we, we try to structure this roadmap is to say that uh, you know, these these are not necessarily linear, where you do one and you go to the next one and the next one. These things kind of sit on top of each other and they stagger. So, you know, the, the Byron is nearly done and we're kind of leaving that era. So that's closed out. But Shelley is going to keep going because the goal there is decentralization. And when is that done? Well, there's lots to do there. And even if you accomplish a little bit, uh, you still always have something more to think about, something more to do. And then decentralization changes when you change the underlying consensus mechanism. So when you go from a single shard replicated system like Ouroboros Genesis to Ouroboros Hydra, you could end up having tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people indirectly or directly participating in consensus. Why? Because it speeds up the system. Whereas right now, replication doesn't. You're just improving decentralization there. So a lot of comments and questions. It's the same for Gogan, the same for Basho, and the same for Voltaire. And what we wanted to do was kind of present a logical display that was self-describing and also provided a content roadmap for iterations of the roadmap. So basically, what that means is when you see a feature like wallet, uh, paper wallet, or, or a Boris this, it will write a description, but then it's a placeholder for us to add a link to a blog, or a link to a video post, or a link to community-generated content. So over time, we can just systematically work our way through the roadmap and keep adding more and more content. The other side of it is that we wanted to have continuous updates. So we were talking about well, when and how should we do that? So every week I get and David gets a lot of weekly reports. So uh, at the Wallet 
back end they put them right in the github repo the german uh, repo the weekly reports are there uh, so i see reports on a pretty ba uh, continuous basis and and the quality of these reports keeps getting better week by week so it would be nice to take an aggregation of all of them maybe monthly or every six weeks and then just do an update to the community and also follow that with some sort of ama where people can populate questions and we can try to get to those questions in a meaningful way and you know the roadmap website is a really good area to actually put the after effect of that so when those videos come out whether they be developer sprints uh they be demos that we do because i see demos and david sees demos every two to four weeks or it be uh you know a monthly ama or something like that uh this is a nice place for that so that was kind of the high level philosophy of what we put together for the uh for the roadmap uh, and, you know, some of it is we have to describe what happened in the past and what did we accomplish, almost like it's a closing report to a client and we say, this is what we've done for you. Then we have to describe where we're currently at and then major themes that the project is going to be encumbering over the next few years. So decentralization, programmability, scaling and governance. And these are all major themes. And then to have a path for how we'll describe more and more over time about those themes and more and more content will materialize and also we can see a continuous flow of updates uh, from our product uh, our project to the uh, to the community uh, and we also have things like medusa for example which actually shows the github commits in real time and you can kind of explore the history of the project and see how we've been evolving it so it's uh it's kind of a new thing. It's kind of an experiment. I, I think it's a lot prettier uh, than the old one, but I also think it'll ultimately be far more powerful because it gives a lot of direction, steer, and focus. And it also allows us to every week say, maybe we should fill in some content here. We can kind of pick and choose our battles instead of having this giant monolithic Gantt charty product product chick uh, management thing with percentages. And then what does like 75% mean to 92% or something? Like when I say paper wallets are 70% done, what does that even mean? It's, it's not a meaningful conveyance. It's a kind of a vanity metric and it doesn't reflect well on this. Instead, we can say, well, what is the target? Where's our goal? And then we can link it to status updates, link it to weekly reports, link it to content. And then people can kind of understand where that's from and they can understand how it fits in relation to kind of the four remaining things that we have to do in the project. So I'll hand it off to David and he can get into, um, into particulars about uh, different things that he came up with while writing the roadmap. Yeah, thank you, Charles. That was perfect. So. Um, uh, uh, it's a living document. You know, as Charles says, we're going to keep adding to it. We're going to add detail not only about the individual functional functional elements, but a lot of detail about status as well. And so, um, uh, uh, Charles mentioned as well, <clears throat> we want to move from providing status as percent um, complete, and I'm going to explain why in a minute, from that to something which is more concrete and frankly more accurate. And so, uh, uh, but we have the content there. I'm really happy you guys said it. It 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 looks and feels simpler to you, because the the there's a fact is, we put a lot more content in it. There's actually a lot more content about functionality, a lot more content about papers, research papers, and specifications, much more. And so that's part of what we wanted to accomplish with the design, which is provide you more, but not have that be cluttered and overwhelming. So I I hope we I hope we accomplish that. That was what we were trying to do. There is a lot more about the functionality in there. And then beyond that, to give you more about, uh, about where we are. And so as an example, Charles mentioned that on a regular basis internally now, we see uh, development demos where we're seeing the status of what's currently built. Now, sometimes it's not a pretty GUI. Sometimes it's a command line interface and it's a lot of data showing on the screen, but we're, what we're seeing is a real live demo of what's built, finished, done, and working. And so that really matters. That's uh, uh, that's really done. And uh, it, what we'd like to do is, on a regular basis, we're thinking every four to six weeks, we will we'll package those up and provide them and, and link to them from the roadmap site. And then along with that, every time we do that, I'll do an AMA video where I start out with an explanation, a description of what we've built in the meantime since we spoke with you last, and then answer any, the questions, any of the questions that the community has. And so along with that would be a roll-up status report, which is kind of a written version of that description of what was built in the meantime. Um, and, uh, and even more often, uh, roll-up of the weekly reports that we're having so you can dig in. So we, we had you know, some, some really interesting debates about it, and we've decided to go extreme, open, transparent on the, on the status stuff. You're going to see what we've built 
There isn't any way to be more transparent. There isn't any way to provide more information. Um, uh, that's that's reality. What is what is what is, what you're able to demo is real. And so we have taken away the percent complete stuff. And so people are. I think a few people are feeling that because you know we haven't started releasing these videos, and so feel the lack. And so it's useful to talk about from a software development perspective why percent complete's hard and problematic. And so this is I've seen this over 20 years on many projects. What's what does done mean? Well, there's code complete done, you initially develop the code. That's a pretty common one. Well, but has it been checked by a peer? Has it been through a code reviewer? Okay, well, that's another kind of done. Then there's done that's been merged into the branch that all the other code's on. That, that Each of these, by the way, can uncover problems and require some additional work. So then there's merged into the branch. And so that's pretty darn done. But what if it's a component that needs to be integrated with another component? And what if those are being built in parallel? Certainly, you've designed them to fit together. But when you integrate two components, you often discover some things, right? So now you've integrated, and you are working on integrating them. And potentially, some per small percentage of things need to change. Well, so now you're op opening up that component again. So was it really done? Because you said it was done. If you had called it done at that time when it was code complete and merged, well, now you're changing it a little bit. So then you might say it's done when you've done all of that. and integrated it with all other components. Well, but has it been through full key QA? And has it been released to the public? So I've been in multiple companies where you end up with something like done, 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 done. And I even was one, it, it, there was like done, done, done to the fourth, right? And and actually, if you, if you were to list out what I just described, I think I just described six versions of done. And so you might then say, well, why don't you just pick one, David, for crying out loud, just choose one and use that and be consistent. Well, as it turns out, for each kind of functionality and each kind of development, different ones would make sense. And so, and then by the way, if at the very end of that you discovered a bug that might need some rework, well, then it's then it went goes then from done back to undone. So it's much more sensible, much more accurate, much more honest and open to just show you what we've built and what is working. That's more, and that's actually real. So rather than than get into to all of this percent complete stuff, we used to spend so much time on it. And it was still not very accurate, uh, so so that's that's the reasoning the reasoning there. And yeah. so, and, and, and there's, a, there's another thing that doesn't map so well with a monolithic waterfall style roadmap is that we actually built Cardano twice. We actually built it three times. We built the Byron version, but then we actually have two versions of the Shelley version, and they are somewhat divergent from each other. And there's going to be a delta between the two. And uh, what we're going to do is inevitably decide. Uh, to pick and choose the features that we like from the Rust side and Haskell side. So the Rust client has kind of an interpretation of the specifications and it went off spec in certain cases where it felt that it could simplify things. And the Haskell client has an interpretation of the specifications. And there are places where these meet and there are places where these are divergent. So part of the exercise is not just saying it's done, is also saying, well, wh what road do we want to go down? because we now actually have two different roads we can take for any major feature, in some cases even more than two roads. For example, with the network stack, there are a lot of visions within the company. Uh, and that's going to be a fun conversation, but it uh, it's it's actually to the benefit of uh, the Cardano ecosystem, because we, we now can kind of have a great conversation about uh, trade-offs and a great conversation about time to market and a great conversation about maintainability and you know, how these things will change over the next 12, 24 months. Most of the time, you just hire an opinionated team, they go do their best job, they build something, and they and you kind of roll the dice and hope what they've built is secure and hope what they've built works. And then you say, well, if it doesn't, oh, well, let's go to the next thing. Uh, we've taken the time to do the science, to do the formal specs, and now we actually have uh, uh, different implementation views of, of the same thing. Uh, this was partly done as an experiment, because I, I did want some internal competition so that we didn't develop a monoculture and, and just move in a very slow way. You know, monopolies tend not to give you good service if, if they're the only show in town, you know, whether you want to move quickly or not, you know, it is what it is. But second, I also really actually wanted to have a little bit of creative freedom where I had developers say, well, maybe we could do things a little bit different. And then it spurs a great conversation about particular things. Uh, you know, and then we've already learned a lot. Uh, along the way, you know, for example, we noticed that in terms of accounting models, if you want to shard smart contracts or if you if you want a really stateless functional system, UTXO is great. But if you're actually looking at accounts like Ethereum style accounts, it maps very well into the proof of stake environment for a lot of the control mechanisms you'd have 
for delegation and for elections and uh, these types of things, or even for the payment of rewards. Uh, it's a little bit more efficient and easier to map that type of a system. So the fact that we have chimeric ledgers means that actually both of them can live in this same system, an account style system and a UTXO style system. Well, that's wonderful, but then there are different ways to implement that, and there are different ways to kind of look at how that relates to the concept of a delegation certificate and registering a stake pool and, and these types of things. And so uh, it's nice to have the Rust client and the Haskell client. And the point of a roadmap is to kind of say that these are the kinds of things we're working on. It, the old roadmap said, well, we had a notion of percentages and completion and done. Well, I have it done, for example, on the Rust side, but then I have in a month or two the Haskell component being done, and now I can compare the two. So do I say it's done uh, because one of the two are done? Well, if both are finished, then it's done. And then if we compare them, decide to make a, a unified change and update the spec to reflect that, well, then it's done. So those are just three different types of done within <laughs> that one context that you can look at. And then also you have to show it to the consumer as well. For example, the incentive scheme. We've started bringing some people on board IOHK who are experts in tokenomics and economics, and we've written an extensive amount of stuff about incentives and, and the reward system. And we have a pretty good idea of where we'd like to go with that, but it's such a vital and important part of the Cardano ecosystem that I think it would be worthwhile to take our incentive specification and share that with those tokenomics experts that we brought on board. And, uh, and have them provide kind of an independent assessment based upon what other systems are doing, like Algorand is doing and uh, what's being proposed and, uh, you know, like EOS and Cosmos and so forth. And, and so that we just get a sanity check that we're in line with what the industry is doing and, and we're not radically away from that. Furthermore, the beta test with our stake pool operators is also very important because ultimately they're going to be the recipients in part of some of those rewards. So that's another example of done, done, and done, and done. You know, so we have a spec, we have an implementation of that spec, we have that implementation of that spec checked by a third party, and then we have a uh, you know the state pool operators examining that and saying, well, this is our two cents and what we think is fair. So we at least get some community feedback before you know we pull a lever and say this is the way to go. Uh, so it makes a lot more sense to have a descriptive roadmap that talks about the philosophy of what is this feature, why are we doing it, what is the corpus of knowledge that we have around this, and then talk about different states and clearly point people to where the code is and clearly point people to where the videos are and so forth. And then you can kind of get a very real sense that things are happening, stuff is getting done, features are being built and implemented. And when there are delays, these are delays often because we're taking a step back and asking, is this really the road we want to go down? Is this something that we really think it makes sense? Or perhaps something has come out in the industry, which is just a lot better. And we said, well, maybe, you know, even if we could do this and ship this, it makes sense to take a step back and re-implement it this particular way. Uh, for example, we had a whole roadmap for identity. And we thought a lot about uh, building a custom identity system for Cardano. And then meanwhile, while we put that on the back burner, we said, well, this is probably the way we're going to go. The DIT standard just started blowing up. And Microsoft has their own identity system. And IBM has their own identity system. And now we have Hyperledger ND and all these other things. And they're all using DIT. You know, and self-sovereign identity is 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 really being pushed along with DID. So a lot of the business requirements behind how we want to do identity and contingent settlement with identity and put some legal weight into these types of transactions and contracts is there. And this is an industry-wide movement. So we can either go alone and keep our original strategy, or we can pivot that strategy a little bit and become now more interoperable with what Microsoft and IBM and all these other guys are doing without compromising the integrity of the project. And in many cases, it makes things better. Another thing is we had another address format that we were looking at, but then we looked at what Blockstream produced with BEC32, and we said, wow, BEC32 is a really, really good address format. It's future-proof. There was a huge amount of thought that went into this for people that have been working on Bitcoin for about eight years, nine years. They have a huge amount of domain expertise and you know they have lots of money and time to analyze these things so we said instead of trying to reinvent the wheel why don't we just converge to a standard there and then suddenly we have a, a, a more universal address format for uh, transactions and in the process of doing that we actually were able to find some design defects using quick check in the spec we were also able to improve the Haskell library of BEC32 as we brought it into our system. So this is an example of you know how things change, where things that you thought were true weren't necessarily true, or you decide to go in a different direction and pivot. And if you're following an agile process, this isn't super expensive. 
uh, it's a thing where you can pivot in two weeks or four weeks and you can go in a different direction and quickly scoop something up and bring it into your system. For example, with the wallet backend, we decided to go from acid state to SQLite because uh, it's a more standard way of doing things. And you know now we're almost done with that integration. And next week, it'll be finished. Uh, so we were able to pivot very quickly and move there and process and prove some libraries along the way. And now it's a very nice standard piece of infrastructure in the, uh, in the ecosystem. Uh, so uh, that's my hope for how this roadmap will be used is, is kind of a, as, a, as a place that kind of shows you the road that we're going down and the options in the road. And then you can kind of follow along with us and see what choices we're making. And then inevitably, it'll become more community oriented because at some point there will be multiple paths and it will no longer be IOHK and Mergo Cardano Foundation's place to decide which path to go. It's going to be community oriented. So as we bring in the Cardano improvement proposal process, those CIPs like Bitcoin has BIPs and Ethereum has IPs, those will be put into the roadmap as well. And there's going to be now options in that tree. Uh, and you can go down this branch or this branch or this branch or maybe combine some of them together. And, th and this is where Voltaire is really going to be prescient because there will be perhaps democratic consensus behind which branch to pursue. And it's no longer just our roadmap. It's now actually a community roadmap. And the site becomes much more interactive in that respect. So this is kind of the vision long term, you know, 12 months, 24 months, 36 months about how we imagine this thing to be used. And it's entirely possible we could even pull it into the Cardano blockchain itself and, and host it through that mechanism. Uh, so we'll, we'll see where it goes. But it's uh, at least in my view, a lot more useful and uh, a lot more realistic uh, than the uh, than the prior roadmap. Yeah. And, and just in terms of answering your question, Rick, about kind of where it is. So we haven't given up on, on trying to communicate when we'll get stuff done. As you mentioned, you can see it at the top in that Gantt chart, uh, 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 forecasting when we believe we'll deliver functionalities. And it's really important to notice there that this isn't some waterfall thing where we finish Shelly and then we wake up the next morning and say, now let's, let's start Gogan. Gogan's been underway for a long time. It's actually going very, very well with smart contracts and Plutus and Marlowe and Meadow. And so, so that's been running in parallel, and we would be able to deliver that fairly soon after Shelley. And in addition, the other efforts as well are already um, started with work happening. And so, so uh, uh, the efforts are, are all going and will get completed in the timeframes that, that you can see there. And what we have for you in terms of content is by far more detailed on Byron and Shelley. We have just an intro on Gogan that'll be coming in coming weeks along with, with Basho and Voltaire. And so we're being a little bit perfection about, perfectionist about what's there, but it will get it, we'll get it to you soon. And in addition, beyond that, you know, right now it's in English, but we'll also be releasing it in Japanese, Korean, and, Ch and Chinese um, over, the, over the coming weeks. And so those versions will come out as well. So we, we wanted to get it out there as soon as we can, as soon as it was useful, um, uh, but, but, but more being added as we go. Yeah, that's fantastic that you're making all those changes to it. You know, and as far as I'm concerned, it's done. I don't think Cardano will be done for like 50 years out into the future. Now, Basho, Gogwin, and Voltaire will be done at some point um, as laid out in the timeline there. But, you know, as the community takes over in the out years, years and years from now, um, it'll continue to expand and grow. So there will be more growth on Cardano far beyond Voltaire in the future. Is that kind of what your expectation is? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we have visions for things many years into the future, and 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 what we've built now uh, supports those. Right? Those functionalities can be grouped into themes for the future, and those can be collected, and those can be added there. And 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 there would be community votes on whether or not to undertake those efforts, and whether or not to take the product in that direction. And then those directions can be represented there in the roadmap. Yeah. yeah that's another wonderful. thing to point out is that um, we've gone through hell. Uh, internally at IOHK for the last year, rewriting a lot of code. Uh, you, you know, when we first released Byron, it, it really didn't meet my expectations of code quality and code flexibility. And uh, some of the people that were working on that were perhaps a bit too junior, and uh, we just made some mistakes there. So we tried very hard to kind of juggle uh, a bunch of balls where we'd have on one hand some people try to fix and upgrade and reduce the technical debt of what was in market and then some people would focus on the new stuff what did we learn and where are we going and it was just really really hard all throughout 2018 and it was something that was very painful uh, along the way the science kept evolving and then we kept moving and realizing that 
while we could implement a protocol one way, it actually made sense to wait two or three months for Agalos and his team to come up with a better improved protocol because it had something that uh, that made more sense. Like, for example, the lack of needs of checkpoints, a much faster way of doing random number generation, you know, these types of things. So, you know, there, there was kind of two sets of delays, some science delays and then uh, some delays related to just these, these two divergent code bases. And so after we finish this entire rewrite, which is coming to a close, it, adding new features is a heck of a lot easier. Like literally we can, in just a few weeks time, build something, put it on the test net, and then boom, we can, we can look at it. And if we really like it, bring it into Cardano fairly quickly. There's no longer gonna be this, well, we have to rewrite everything from scratch and you know, pay that huge price. And a year later, we'll come back and then you'll have your feature. We'll be able to add this thing in, in short order. Uh, so what that means is that A, you get stuff faster, but B, it also means that it gives us the ability to diversify and ask what if. Uh, that's something that not a lot of cryptocurrency projects tend to do. What they do is they 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 get dogmatically write these improvement proposals. There's a big political fight. And then once they finally reach a consensus, they say, okay, this is the way, let's go build it and you know, put it in. But what if we just you know, go ahead and deploy three, four alternative test nets to view different features and different designs and different ideas, different crypto. And uh, and let's just see what happens. And then uh, now we can run that experiment real time and it, the community can kind of decide which one of these flavors do you like. Um, it also will make it easier for people to add code into our code base. You know, it's incredibly important for the long-term viability of the project that what we've written and, and what we've built is truly an open source project. So it's not just something that we work on and we understand, and only if you talk to the oracles at IOHK can you learn uh, how to add things to it. It's really important that an arbitrary developer who's interested, who's sufficiently skilled, can just look at the code without ever talking to us and actually build something reasonable. I mean, this is the standard that Ethereum brought into the space. Uh, with Ethereum Classic, when we built the Mantis client for them, we never once talked to the Ethereum Foundation or any of the Ethereum core developers. We started with the yellow paper, the white paper, and the documentation, and we built a client from scratch that was interoperable with not just Ethereum Classic, but also Ethereum, which is a really impressive achievement, but it's also an impressive achievement for how well the Ethereum people documented things. So that's kind of the measuring stick. And it's important that we also provide that into, into the community. And, we provide a process for how new ideas can be proposed, a process for how we can test things, a process for how we can build social credibility and social capital that our meritocratic capital that certain people should be listened to. And uh, that's, an, that's another route that we wanna go down. Uh, a lot of that depends on the quality of the documentation, the quality of specifications. Uh, for example, with the test net, and we'll get to that in a bit, but just to, to divert it just for a moment for the sake of clarity, uh, the test net, uh, the self node test net, we actually have a red team, black team model that we're following right now for the documentation. So the developers wrote documentation and then we assigned other developers, some inside IOHK, some outside of IOHK who are totally independent to read and criticize the documentation and say that it's, this is where we think it's missing or give suggestions. And we'll just keep running that through iteration after iteration. And then when the test net comes out, uh, the community will then give us a lot of feedback and then we can just keep iterating there. It's the same case for all code documentation and all feature documentation within our ecosystem. Uh, the conceptual documentation, the philosophical documentation, kind of the, the, the business purpose documentation of these things, all of these are subject to feedback from us, our red teams within our company, and then from the general public. And then eventually it'll create a template for third parties to propose things and uh, bring them into Cardano completely independent of um, IOHK and Emergo and the Cardano Foundation. Yeah, and the self-node testnet, you know, we could tell um, there's like a, a rogue group of guys on Telegram, like Kylo and Malik and Chrisios and uh, a couple other folks, and they were able to, Kylo runs the lovelace.community webpage, which is one of the, it's going to be a stake pool, and he wrote a script. Now, I'm not a programmer, but I was able to take a script, he, and he pointed it to the documentation as a reference, and able to just smash the buttons on my computer and have a, a node running. A Yorgamander wrote, and I'm not a software engineer, I'm kind of like maybe DevOps a little bit, but I was able to do it based off the documentation. And I think some of those folks in that Telegram channel would be great to get the feedback about you know, uh, the documentation on them from community members because they're looking at it and they're using it to build notes. 
Yeah, well, absolutely. That's that's part of our objective in, in doing it, right? And so we can tell you the test net's coming soon, maybe a week, week and a half. Uh, we're going to be doing, it's going to be MVP functionality. So core capabilities so that we can test that with those folks that you're just mentioning, these, these, these folks that can help us refine that. And then we'll do rolling releases as we add functionality. And so a big part of the goal in doing this is to bring those folks in. Uh, we, we, we ask them to, to fill out a survey. Who are they? What kind of technical background? What are they interested? Is this a commercial interest or a hobby? Lots of info. And we had an amazing response, 150 people and counting. And so <clears throat> these people are extremely knowledgeable, motivated. They already know a lot about Cardano and we want to collaborate with them. We want to bring them in. We want to learn from them. So to improve our documentation, to improve the code itself, how it's functioning. And so it's going to be a challenge to collaborate and interact with 150 plus people, but we think it's worthwhile. We're going to learn a lot. It's going to make a better product. It's going to make better documentation and we'll learn a lot from them and, and refine it. So, so we're excited to, to start it. That sounds good. That sounds good. I wanted to hop back over to the roadmap quickly. So I noticed that there are a lot of KPIs that are scattered through each era of Cardano and a lot, there's a lot of overlap. So if you look at Shelly and you look at Basho, Basho is supposed to be the scaling era of Cardano, but there's also scaling within Shelly. So is it is there overlap between both eras or is this completely different? Because it seems like there's miniature scaling within each era and then there's like that maximum scaling within there that is. one era. So there is. is there overlap or is this completely independent? Yeah. Scaling is not a not like Shambhala or you know Nirvana, you know, some place that you reach and say I've scaled. You know, it's not like I've, you know, reached uh, reached uh, uh, the epitome of protocol design. The reality is that scaling is is kind of a multivariate and a multi-stage process, and it's also contextual to the domain you're talking about, and it's also contextual to the use cases that uh, that you have. So uh, every era, Gogan, Basho, Shelley, Voltaire. You're going to see things leak their way into the Cardano protocol uh, to improve things a little bit, whether it be enhancements to the network stack, uh, you know, changes we make to the block architecture, changes we make to the consensus algorithm. Uh, and so Basho's primary focus are the big things. So that's where you go from a single shard to a multi-shard environment and also start experimenting with layer two solutions, whether they be ephemeral off-chain computation like MPC circuits or networks like Lightning. Uh, which provides some value you know that's that's where we begin the broad scale experimentation but if we discover something that can make our system 50 percent faster and it's in the critical path while we're doing shelly of course we'd put that in we wouldn't wait and say ah you know we'll come to it later um it, it makes sense it's not a major slowdown and it allows us to make a better impression as people start entering and joining the system there really does need to be kind of a baseline performance for a cryptocurrency these days for people to take it seriously. So that's performance in terms of how long it takes for a transaction to settle. That's performance in terms of how many transactions per second can you do. And it's important that Shelley and Gogan have those characteristics so that people take it seriously, are willing to build things on top of it and really push the network to its limitation while we are getting to the act of building Bosch and pulling this whole thing together. Uh, so that's why you'll see these types of things. And furthermore, you're going to see uh, decentralization things that we do uh, during Voltaire and during Basho uh, that we, you know, you'd think would live in Shelley. And that's why I said it's not linear. It's kind of like layers on top of each other. And these threads continue. There's even still kind of Byron efforts like more exchange listings uh, to increase liquidity, uh, you know, things like improving the API, things like working with third party integrators and getting more wallets to support the framework. You know, that started in Byron, but that's not going to close off and end. We're going to keep doing that. And uh, every so often, we may go back and considerably refine the experience. Like, for example, we've had an internal conversation about moving from REST APIs to kind of more of like a GraphQL style way of doing things, which could be a superset and allow you to, to reuse the old stuff, but give us a much more refined way of doing um, APIs. So there's little things like that that we've been, uh, that we've been looking at. And... Uh, the point of the roadmap is to kind of layer them on top of each other and give you a clear description of what are we doing, and then we'll just keep adding to it. But there are eras, you know. Uh, Basho is over. 
We're now in the Shelley era, and eventually we'll be in the Gokun era. And that means the primary focus of the majority of the developers is this topic domain. So if you know we were doing 80-20, maybe 20% will be doing a little bit of other stuff, either prep work for future things or refining some old business. But the bulk of our resources and effort is in this particular focus area, whether that be decentralization or smart contracts or scalability. Charles, you also mentioned that there are certain key factors that people consider when they're using a particular blockchain. So you mentioned TPS and you mentioned settlement time. These things are very important. So is the design of the roadmap, is, is it specific to certain institutions or certain people in the game that are going to use Cardano in the future? Is that how you molded the product as like your sort of capability statement towards them? Or is it more of the investor now and you know, there might be a switch or a convergence in the future, or is it vice versa? Um, I'm not sure if I yeah, no, articulated it correctly. We, we don't think a lot about investors at IOHK. You know, the, the, the whole investment thesis of the cryptocurrency industry is a bit bizarre and, and just strange. Uh, you, you know, things go up for no reason, things collapse for no reason. Like, I can't for the life of me understand how Bitcoin SV just went to the moon, and, you know, the last month. It's just like, okay. Uh, because a vanity copyright was awarded. I mean, that's the only external thing that I can see. It looks more like market manipulation. On the other hand, really good projects sometimes just linger far, far down on coin market cap and they don't get a lot of traction, which is a strange thing as well. And uh, there's always the next big thing that's coming, like uh, like Elrond is coming and Harmony is coming and Algorand is coming and all that stuff is there. And then people have big announcements like EOS had their big June announcement and that was a bit of a flop, uh, you know, and, and also people take things in bizarre directions. They say, oh, well, the EOS guys uh, visited some event at the White House, and therefore that means Donald Trump is going to endorse EOS and, you know, have the U.S. government start using it. I mean, you see these things happen. So it's a, it's a lost cause if you get trapped in the in the behavior of making investors happy or, or talking to these people. First, we don't have a fiduciary obligation to that. We're a technology company. And second, even if we did, there's nothing we can say or do to make anything really meaningful. It's a Bitcoin's game. Bitcoin goes up, it drags the markets up. Bitcoin goes down, it drags the markets down. Furthermore, you end up looking like Justin's son and you spend like $4 million, $5 million to go have lunch with Warren Buffett. I, I think I think he's out of ideas at this point. You know, he's, you know, I, I've met the guy many times and it's just crazy to see what they have to do to keep that hype machine going. It's almost, uh, it's almost like you're a shock jock in, after you've said all the crazy stuff, you're you're looking for progressively more insane things to do to keep the same shock value for your for your audience. Uh, so that group we don't think too much about. You know, the other stakeholder analysis we do is we say, look, first there's a group of people that just want to know what is Cardano, where is it going, and so there needs to be a funnel to capture these people and take them on a, a narrative journey of why are we doing what we're doing, what is our philosophy, what techniques we are, uh, and where are we going. And then why are we credible to do that as an ecosystem? So that's kind of your, your, your hero's journey of Cardano for the general public. And then there's particular demographics like the stake pool operators, uh, demographics like the exchanges and infrastructure providers, uh, demographics like the smart contract developers, uh, or demographics like the scientists. For example, a huge constituency of ours is the academic community and the functional programming community. And we are not a passive participant in these ecosystems where we take research and implement it. We're actively writing papers. Or Boris has been cited more than 250 times. Uh, that's a very rare paper to write that with that much impact. And we're preparing for journal publication. Uh, so it's uh, it's it means that we'd like those constituencies to see where we're going because they'll come to us and say, by the way, I'm doing research in this area. We'd love to collaborate and write a paper with you. The same for the functional programming space where we're not just a passive citizen using libraries. We're actually making Haskell better. For example, we're working on Haskell to JavaScript. So we actually hired the guy who created GHCJS and we're making that considerably improved. So you have a good development experience there. We're working with Tweak to help build out Haskell to WebAssembly so you can get Haskell to work on the web browser. Uh, so there's a lot of things there that, that we're contributing and doing. And so it's important in that roadmap, not just to say, hey, dApp developers come build stuff. and hey, people are interested in cryptocurrencies can build stuff. It's really important to also mention to the scientists, the functional programming, the people in the open source software community, that uh, the existence of this project is a, a, a synergistic good citizen. 
its mere existence makes everything around it, everything it touches better. If we integrate a library, we're going to seriously touch, test it. Like for example, Beck 32, we threw quick check and all these other things at it, and we discovered design defects and bugs and all kinds of things in a, a code that we didn't write in a specification we didn't design. And then we went to the authors of it and we said, hey, look, we found all these issues with it. And they said, wow, that's great. We'll fix it. Uh, and Or we'll at least put a disclaimer on certain things that can't be fixed. And, and now it's in their repo as much as it is ours. So the roadmap is another important tool for that, that constituency. And I think that's an under-focused part of the cryptocurrency space. Uh, you know, we're all so competitive and everybody's in this win-lose mindset that, uh, that we just tend to think, Whatever EOS does, EOS does, or IOTA does, IOTA does, and that's it. It's static, it's siloed, and either I hate it or I love it, uh, you know, or I, I like a collection of them, but I hate everything else, and that's really a tragic thing. You know, some days we wake up, we're friends, and some days we wake up, we're enemies. That's a mature space. Uh, look at Apple and Samsung. They sue each other all the time. They're at each other's throats all the time, and every single iPhone that's deployed uses Samsung memory. So... <laughs> So, you know, some part of Samsung gets to see the iPhone well before any of us do, and some part of Samsung is trying to figure out what the iPhone looks like so they can compete with it within the same company. And that's the, the, what we need to aspire to do as an industry, and things like good roadmaps help you get there because your competing projects can look at and say, we have synergies with what you're doing, and we would like to collaborate with you on those particular synergies, even though we're competing on the, uh, on the overall market share. Yeah, thanks for that complex explanation there, Charles. And hey, I'd like to bring Sebastian in. I haven't talked to you in a while, Sebastian. Can you translate a little something for me? Charles mentioned something about a Haskell to JavaScript language. How does that help me buy a Lambo? <laughs> right. So <laughs> I had to throw that in there. Yeah, so the one of the biggest problems you, you can think of for Daedalus, right, is how do you connect Daedalus with the rest of the code base, right? And so whenever you launch Stateless, you'll see like a, a message says like, you know, connecting to Node. And for some users that hasn't worked out that well. And so how do you kind of resolve these situations? You can think of the same thing with, with Plutus, where you can imagine, you know, you're running Plutus on your machine. How do you connect that to a website, to a wallet, this kind of information? How do you embed an application into another one? One of the easiest ways to do that uh, in the industry is JavaScript and WebAssembly right now, right? And it basically allows you to take one program and easily embed it into another, right? And that's kind of one of the things that's allowed uh, Yoroi to work so well, because we've been able to take the Rust code base and embed it into our application, as opposed to Daedalus, which has to connect. And so, you know, websites need this technology also, right? Whenever you want to access a website that uses Plutus, you'd like, you know, Plutus to run inside the website uh, for an easy developer experience, an easy user experience. And so, uh, the Rust ecosystem has had that capability for a while, uh, but IOHK is helping the Haskell uh, ecosystem also gain that capability. So, like we can also easily embed, for example, the Cardano wallet Haskell code base into Daedalus, or we can implement Plutus code base directly into Daedalus. And these kinds of connections are just uh, much easier to maintain, much easier to program, and often provide a better user experience. And which bucket does that fit into? Does that fit into like the Shelly bucket, the Byron bucket, or does it just kind of permeate the entire no, uh, it's, process? No, it's, it's the engineering uh, improvements. But it, it does fit into all of them in a certain sense because it gives you more options how you look at things. So if it's into the Gogan bucket because it means that our off-chain code can now run in the browser or can run as a node package or something like that, whereas previously you had less options and it helps you be on more systems and be interoperable with mobile experiences and so forth. But then it also fits into the Byron era because you're saying, hey, uh, you know, if you're building a wallet, instead of just having a Rust code base, now you can use a Haskell code base for your backend. So, you know, you can decide which one you want to use. So you have more options. And then it's just a question of which one is more feature complete for you. And then, you know, it fits into decentralization because it gives us <clears throat> different platforms that we can now deploy things like stake pools and, uh, and things like, uh, you know, delegation centers and so forth. So we can capture more users and get more people staking and get more people running the system. It's actually a big question of how hard is it going to be to get Cardano to run on low power devices like Raspberry Pis or Rock Pis. Marcus has done some phenomenal work there. And so the, the more tool chains, the more backends, the more things that you can use with this, uh, the more options you have in that pursuit of getting something to run on low-powered metal, which means you now have brought the price point of admission down 
for uh, for more people. Furthermore, it also allows you to have discussions about uh, low power trusted hardware devices. Like for example, if you look at the Rust card uh, uh, code base, we have something called Secure Enclave, and we've been pulling that code into its own little thing specifically because we're going to start running experiments of compiling that code to run in trusted modules. For example, on Intel SGX or Zimbit or other devices. And the point of that is that then we can get additional security for free. We're just compiling it, running it in a different place, and we've architected things so that that's kind of a black box to the program, but instead of it running on your regular desktop, your regular operating system, now it's running in a secure operating system. And so it's like having a trusted hardware device built into your MacBook or built into your Windows computer or to your laptop. And you get it just for free. It's just an added value. Plus, you can enhance the security of the system. For example, you can use uh, the, uh, the module to do key erasure for the uh, key evolving signatures or so forth. So you get an additional guarantee that these types of things have been done. So uh, every time you make these decisions, they tend to permeate different parts of the roadmap. And that's an example of just writing good code and thinking around the problem. And this is just under-resourced. This is underappreciated in our industry. We Again, we just fork stuff or take stuff and we play around with it. We say, well, that's as good as it's going to be. What we do at IOHK is we say, we start with the philosophy and then we say, what tools are best for this philosophy? And then what we do is we open those tools up and make them useful for more and more systems so that we can not trade off all the gains that we've had in terms of correctness or efficiency or uh, in terms of security. We can keep all of that, but now we can get our you know, have our cake and eat it too. We can have it on different platforms and make it easier for developers to work with it. The the fundamental principle there is that if we build a, a, a useful product that is powerful, that is easy to build on, uh, then people will build applications on it and there will then be a lot of transactions on it. And that's what makes ADA valuable. So we don't worry about, uh, you know, how can we pump ADA and who can we convince? We worry about building a very valuable product that people want to build solutions on, and then it will be valuable. So that's uh, that's the fundamental principle there. And so, what you what you mentioned was was one of those. If we can if we can make it possible to use more development languages and to be able to embed those, and uh, uh, that both enables us to do new things and enables developers with certain skill sets to easily be onboarded, then that makes it a more useful platform for for uh, for more audiences. You think about the value proposition of, of a cryptocurrency. I mean, it's almost like a road. So imagine if you go and you build this big four-lane road in the middle of a desert, and there's really no connecting cities nearby. Not many people drive that road. So you have a lot of throughput, a lot of capacity, but it's useless. Now, take that same road and put a city around it, put tons of shops around it, lots of things to do, universities around it. And then suddenly the road gets congested, but that's a very valuable road. And if it ever went down, it would make everybody's lives miserable and it enhances things in a certain way. So infrastructure is like that. Infrastructure is directly proportional to the uses of the infrastructure and how people are using the infrastructure and also the path and planning for growth of that infrastructure and the upgradability of that infrastructure. And if you get it right, it's a joy. For example, I love Osaka. It's a great city, and I've never been in a traffic jam there. It's been always easy to get around, and it's uh, it's a lot of fun. I hate Tokyo. It is it's it's like a spider web nightmare of infrastructure. The subway is super packed. They have guys that push you into the trains. It's a it's a pretty crazy experience. Uh, so I you know it, when you get it right, it's magical. When you get it wrong, you're like Ubi or uh, or like uh, Jakarta. And cryptocurrencies are the same way, and their value is long-term directly proportional to that. So it should be self-evident. You don't have to explicitly spell it out. It should be self-evident. Why would people want to use this? Where are they going to use this? How are they going to use this? And if, if you haven't really articulated that, then you haven't done your job. That's where you focus. And then everything else just falls into place. People kind of get it. Uh, Apple really doesn't need to sell the iPhone. They don't need to make the case and walk you through every single feature of these things. Uh, they just make it self-evident that the iPhone can do these types of things, and then people discover that, and then they they provide marketing for everyone else. And that's kind of the magic of good ecosystems. You mentioned Intel SGX. So are these like layer two solutions? Because I know that Intel SGX has a has like a maximum virtual memory that you can embed, I guess, transactions or whatever data you're putting in. So is this going to exist separately, or is this going to be? on the main chain? Is this a layer one or layer two so, solution? So this is layer one because you're talking about the underlying cryptography to use Cardano. And either that's going to be running on your drive, on your 
their operating system could be lazy, could be running in a trusted hardware module. Uh, there are many different environments you can run that in. Now, as a general rule, you'd like that environment to be as secure and simple as possible and as vetted as possible so that there's a very low probability that malware or unauthorized access or uh, some bizarre event comes in and it results in the loss of your private key or your keys to be cloned or compromised or uh, something along those lines. So uh, the, Intel has invested literally billions of dollars into building out SGX, and it makes really no sense since it's there, the consumer has it, if we can target that and make it an option where you can run it with SGX extensions or not, uh, to just go down that road. Because eventually you're gonna have a lot of cryptographic credentials that exist within your wallet. You're gonna have things that allow you to decrypt your metadata. Uh, you're gonna have your identity like a did. Uh, you're gonna have all your, your HD keys and perhaps recovery phrases, all of these assets, and you have to store them somewhere. And either the consumer is going to store them on paper, a trusted hardware device like a ledger, or just on their hard drive and with some degree of encryption. And, and if we can get 95% of what the ledger device does and put that into that enclave, that's a huge win for the consumer. In fact, this is the direction that mobile devices are going. The Samsung X10, for example, has support now for cryptocurrencies. Apple just put support into iOS 13, and apparently they're opening up some of their trusted hardware capabilities in their devices. And most phone manufacturers, whether it be Huawei or HTC or uh, Google, uh, they're actually putting in special trusted hardware modules into their hardware. And they're now going to open these things up on a limited basis to make them accessible to developers to deploy things like key management for uh, digital rights management, for credentials, for email, and yes, for cryptocurrencies. So this is a trend the next three years, five years, seven years, 10 years, we're going to be seeing in the space as consumers get more apt and inclined to use cryptographic credentials to access the web, to access their identity and these things. And we can piggyback on that trend specifically to do better key management. So what does this practically mean? It means you can do things like if I lose my phone, I don't have to worry that my crypto is going to be stolen and I perhaps have a nice path to recovery. For example, I can put my private keys from my wallet securely on your trusted hardware on your phone and use you as a recovery device with a strong guarantee that you can't access those keys. That's pretty remarkable if you think about it from an availability thing that I could take stuff that I have that's all I put a billion dollars of my money and put it on your cell phone and somebody else's cell phone I don't even like and somehow some way they can't access that and I can recover that. That's the magic and power of trusted hardware if you trust the hardware. Um, and these devices continue to get better. Now, every now and then you see things like heart, uh, Spectre and, uh, and, and, and these aren't perfect. Uh, so you'd still do things like encrypt it when you put it on. But it, 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 it does mean that over the next few years, people are thinking about these. The cryptographic techniques for verifying the hardware is correct is exponentially improving. The amount of scientists taking it seriously and trying to break it is improving. And, and we're seeing a huge increase in quality for these devices. They get more resource rich, they're getting more capable, and furthermore, they're already deployed. There are billions of Intel SGX devices, there's billions of ARM trust zone devices, there's billions of iPhones that have these capabilities. And so now as an engineer, it's my decision, do I, do I acknowledge that and build for that? Or do I just totally ignore it, pretend it doesn't exist until my competitors do it and I have to, I have to just you know, catch up with them and, and beg to be in these systems? That was, wonderful. Like that was wonderful. So Rick, do you want to move on to the Reddit questions and let's see if we can get some in? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Charles, thanks for that description on infrastructure. And now we're going to go to some of our communications infrastructure. And one of those is Reddit. We also like Telegram. Uh, but on Reddit, the question posted there was um, leaving questions about the roadmap here. And I'll start off with the first one. I have our Reddit thread sorted by top comments. And our first one comes from Decrow66. And we got to do rapid fire. These are going to be rapid fire Reddit questions so we can get through at a good pace. And the first one from Decrow66, he says, uh, can you talk about quantum security and how it be implemented into ADA? And there's a second question, are there any exchanges participating? So let's stick with the first question there. Can you talk about quantum security and how it be implemented into ADA? That's definitely a Charles question. <laughs> So quantum computers are kind of these scary things that everybody looks at. They go, oh, God, quantum computers, as soon as they come out, everything comes to an end. It's going to kill my dog and burn my house down. And, you know, it's going to be road, road warrior and, you know, Mad 
Max and uh, you know the Doof Warrior will be playing with a flaming guitar. This is this is the the canonical view when we hear the dangers of quantum computing. You know the, the reality is that uh, these things creep up in matters of decades, not in matters of weeks or months. Uh, and we can kind of see the state of that entire industry from what IBM, Google, Microsoft, and others prominent quantum computing groups are doing. In fact, the best conference I, I personally attend is crypto for these things, and it's usually in Santa Barbara, which I think it's always been there. And the guy who's in charge of Google's quantum computing group is a professor at UCSB. So he did, tends to do a presentation at crypto and say, this is the latest and greatest of quantum computers and what we can do, what we can't do. So the general consensus right now within uh, the cryptographic community and within the computing world is that quantum computers probably will exist and that they probably will at some point within the next 10 or 20 years get powerful enough to become a threat to traditional crypto like RSA and elliptic curve and, and these types of things because of the way these computers work. So what does that mean? It means today there is a big effort from NIST to start standardizing post-quantum crypto. So we're starting to ask questions like, what can a quantum adversary do? And based upon those attacks, what type of crypto will I need to bring into the space? So for example, you need better signature schemes. So there's hash-based crypto, lattice-based crypto, these types of things. And basically the long and the short is they're just changing the hardness assumptions, the mathematical properties, and, and going to slightly different math, and somehow, some way, we, we have a, a kind of a community consensus that this approach probably will give us a degree of resilience and resistance to a quantum computer. Now, that's just for the public-private key pairs, so the stuff behind how you spend your money. Okay. The problem is that a lot of these high-level crypto things that we do, like, for example, zero-knowledge crypto or MPC, they do have buried within the assumptions things that would be broken if quantum computers existed. So those more sophisticated primitives only work right now with the old legacy crypto. So while we can harden things like checkpoints and, uh, and securing your money, uh, we may lose privacy or we may have some trouble with the way we do the consensus protocol or random number generation if a quantum computer existed. So this is an open question and it is something that requires more research. So what we've done at IOHK is kind of look at this in terms of a three-stage process. The first stage process is just to get history somewhat locked down in a way that would make it really difficult for a quantum computer to unwind things. So that's the idea of a quantum resistant checkpoint that we do ever so often. Uh, so we hired Peter Schwabe, he's an expert in this field, and we're writing a paper with him. And basically he's designing a checkpoint mechanism that we can put in maybe at the end of every epic. And then that would then allow us to have kind of a sub-ledger that would give us some certainty that, uh, you know, if a quantum computer existed, they wouldn't be able to just unwind history instantly. The second approach is to start taking a step back and have a deeper discussion about what is a quantum adversary? What capabilities does this adversary actually have? And how does this impact every component of the system? So how does it impact the consensus algorithm? How does it impact your money? How does it impact how we use hashes? Well, whatever it may be, what will that adversary be able to do? And then we have to kind of say, well, okay, if we wanted to harden or make ourselves resistant from that, what are the trade-offs? The problem with this new fangled crypto is it's uh, first, it's a lot more sophisticated. So there's a lot of areas where it potentially could have weaknesses, like there's uh, uh, Entru is an example of a signature scheme, and it has all these problems with it. Uh, so it, it, because it's more sophisticated, there's more opportunity for it to have flaws. And the second, it tends to be a lot less efficient, like 10, 20, 100 times larger signature sizes, a lot longer time to compute. And when you're dealing with an environment like a blockchain where resources are quite scarce, it's a bitter pill to swallow to say that we should move the entire system to be you know, immune to some magic quantum adversary uh, if it means that everything's 100 times slower and we have a blockchain that's 100 times larger and potentially we lose features, like we can no longer do zero knowledge proofs or something with this type of a system. So we have to model the adversary and then we have to understand where we'd like to be. And then the third pillar is to take the old stuff that we used to do and find ways to keep doing it, but then do it with some semblance of the efficiency uh, that we've we've come to know and enjoy uh, with elliptic curve crypto and so forth. Very complicated, and it's not going to be solved by anybody, any any cryptocurrency that claims to have this, uh, unless Dan Bonet is building it with the Stanford Crypto Group, and they, they have like five papers we haven't read, uh, I would be very skeptical. But at the very least, in terms of uh, the particular checkpointing, 
uh, that's not super sophisticated, and it's actually a, a really good step forward. Uh, and uh, that paper was supposed to be done uh, last quarter, but uh, Peter has been kind of adding some extra stuff to it. So throughout the summer, that paper should be, and we'll kind of wind it in either towards the end of Shelley or sometime during the Gokin phase as a, as a nice closing protocol. Now, another thing is that this is actually closely related to how we handle shard management with um, Ouroboros Hydra. So the way we designed Ouroboros is that, you know, epics kind of have a beginning, a middle, and an end, and there's an election, and you populate them. But it is conceivable that you can run epics in parallel, but then you need some sort of coordinator to actually decide which shards your, which epics your transactions are going to go into, and also to allow cross shard communication, cross shard transactions. Well, the easiest way of doing that would be taking horizontal, vertically some sort of committee from those shards and then using a BFT protocol or something like that. Well, if we did that, it would also be conceivable to have those close the epics and then build a checkpoint there. So it'd be very logical during the Bashu era, uh, once Hydra is done, to put in the quantum checkpointing scheme. But we may add it a little bit, a bit earlier because of uh, side chains or faster bootstrapping or, or something like that. So it's it's definitely here. It's not a super high priority because nobody has a working quantum computer uh, at the moment that can really break any of these things. And, uh, you know, we're still in a position where we we can preserve history through other means, uh, you know, like just by hashing it or something like that. So it's a fascinating topic and it's uh, younger people than me are studying it and will get Nobel prizes and Turing awards when they come up with major results. Uh, but it's kind of for the next generation, not quite for where we're at right now. Wow, thank you for that in-depth answer, Charles. And uh, the next question is, how do you fit all that stuff in your head? No, I'm just kidding, that's not a question in there. Uh, the next question is also from Decrow66, and that was, are there any exchanges like Coinbase or Binance participating in the Shelley testnet experiment? Thank you very much. Thank you, Decrow66. Yeah. We, uh, yeah, no comment. Sorry. Okay. Okay, okay. so we'll delete that one out. Uh, okay. No, no, you can leave it in. Oh, okay. it's, it's actually okay. a record. I think it's the fastest time I've ever answered a question. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay. That was the answer. Yay. All right. Felipe, over right. to you, sir. Okay. Um, the next user is Arjun Fosek. And this is a very long question, so I'm just going to try to sum it up quickly. And they basically said that the new roadmap looks amazing. Great work, guys. Is IOHK open to constructive criticism? as I would see benefits in the following points being addressed on the roadmap. They're saying it's difficult to map an update to specific era entries, difficult to distinguish between completed, in progress, and on hold features. Um, the progress indicator, they're asking for the percentages back. Uh, David touched on this earlier. And um, they're asking about uh, priority RAG indicators. So I'm, I'm assuming that's like the red, amber, green for project management. Um, are you going to have some sort of RAG indicators for each era to distinguish between high priority objectives and low priority objectives? And uh, the small icons are adding small icons to uh, showcase the number of people working on the Cardano project. It's a very long question, but he had some critiques, I believe. I guess um, I don't know how you want to approach this question. Maybe it's some things that may be changing in the future with the roadmap. Well, what I would say is we're always interested in constructive feedback. So the answer to the first question is absolutely yes, always. Um, and and I mean, I wrote down his points, and, and so we won't forget about them. Um, I have some concern about each of them. Um, and so one, we've already discussed why percentages are hard. I want to give more information and more detail, but in another way, which can be consistently accurate. Um, and, and for the same reason that percentage complete is difficult, in progress is the same way. It gets finished and you find a bug, it's not finished anymore. So in progress goes back and forth and then you have to have a conversation about, about why. Um, we could discuss priorities, um, um, uh, but that's also a little, it's either, you know, at the moment it's kind of either in or out, it's part of scope or not. Um, uh, and, so, and so we're not really thinking about it as what might get thrown off the bottom. Uh, the, the items that are there are items we would like to be part of the scope. And the number of people shifts shifts pretty often as progress happens on different components. And so um, that would be an example where in an effort to provide more information, it, it, it would it would most it would be inaccurate as often as it was inaccurate. So so anyway, I wrote them down. Um, though I, 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 
I've described my concerns about them, but I won't forget them. Um, uh, it's not, they're not invalid questions. That sounds good. Thank you for the question. Um, next Reddit question. Rick, do you want to get it? Yeah, this is from uh, Reddit user Lion Likes Cookies. I, I like that username. That's cool. Okay. And Lion Likes Cookies says, thanks for all the hard work, guys. The roadmap looks nice. David seems to be a good choice for destroyer of FUD. I like that, too. <laughs> I like that, too. I like that. And so I that my little finger voice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so the question is, could you speak on fiat system interoperability? I'm interested in having a fiat support at the premium for Cardano contracts while crypto gains adoption. Are there crypto banks and payment processors in the works? That's really interesting. Yeah, this is the most difficult area. It's kind of the last mile of cryptocurrencies. This is this is our fiber optic problem, right? You know, you had this thing. If only we had this, everything would be great. You know, the internet would be perfect, right? It's the same situation with uh, cryptocurrencies. You know, we, we have this bridge where you can go from any cryptocurrency to another cryptocurrency with atomic cross-chain swaps or decentralized exchanges or fiat-free exchanges quite easily and securely and get great things like proof of solvency or strong security guarantees or whatever. But the minute that you actually want to go to the good old US dollar, that 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 gap is pretty significant. It's so significant that you know, I did things like work with Dan and create BitShares and uh, other people have done things like create uh, Gemini coin and Tether and even Facebook is creating their own coin. Uh, so it is very unlikely sans the Federal Reserve or the European Union issuing their own token uh, that we're going to have native fiat interoperability. What is more likely is that a stable coin will end up becoming some form of market standard. And that stable coin then is basically the, the value pair that people use to do cash in, cash out for our ecosystem. So for example, you know, Tether right now is that stable coin. And we kind of treat it like the dollar and then something will emerge. The problem is that unless a government's issuing it, even if a government's issuing it, this is kind of like reinventing finance in the 19th century in the United States. Uh, we had hundreds of banks, regional banks throughout the entire US issuing their own currencies and almost all of them became fractional reserve and, and uh, insolvent within 10 to 20 years of issue. In fact, Heather itself, it was supposed to be fully backed and now we find out it's not only because of a, a regulatory and law enforcement event, as many people suspected it wasn't. Uh, so uh, the best we can do is just look at where these standards emerge. And then furthermore, uh, if certain sovereignties, like for example, Ethiopia or Uganda or Mongolia are interested in issuing stable coins, we can get them into the Cardano ecosystem and become interoperable. And if those things become uh, you know, market standards, uh, then we basically kind of have like a fiat bridge. Because what people are really saying in fiat is, I would like to be able to like my bank account, store my wealth there because I don't want to speculate. I want stability there. And I'd also like to be able to use it uh, as a means of exchange and be able to easily go and pay my phone bill and my rent and these other things uh, with low fees and low friction. And I'd also like to use it for other things like lending and remittances. If you can't do these things, you don't have a very valuable currency. Uh, so while ADA is a component, like Bitcoin and Ether are components to that story, it's not the end of the story. You need a lot of other things that have to come in. Uh, one interesting topic is the algo stable coins. And this is an understudied area. Um, we have things like MakerDAO, for example, but basically the idea of can we even create a synthetic asset that actually holds its value? We tried to do that with BitShares, it didn't work. And then Dad tried to do it again with the Steam Dollar and it didn't work so well. Uh, it just was too expensive to create these types of assets uh, in those types of models. But uh, if you can't do it as an algo, well then you are now trusting a issuer or a federation of issuers for that and by definition that's not a cryptocurrency so you can be interoperable with it but then you go from a decentralized trust no one but the code world to i trust bob bob's bank because they've issued this thing and that's not what most people in the space have signed up for philosophically uh, so it is kind of a complicated area a uh, last point that i'll mention is the regulatory compliance you guys may have noted the uh, noticed the fatf standards uh, proposal and uh, a lot of legislation and a lot of policy group discussion in this area, but it's becoming increasingly likely that these types of assets, whether they be security tokens or asset-backed 
uh, tokens like uh, Tether may require a KYC component and they may require some form of compliance information to be embedded within the transaction itself. Uh, so uh, there has to be some sort of way of reconciling the fact that you're going from an unregulated asset, unregulated system with no terms and conditions on transference to an asset that has restrictions on who can hold it and what type of compliance information and metadata needs to be embedded within the asset. The advantage of Cardano is we kind of thought ahead. We thought about metadata embedding and contingent settlement and did embedding and these types of things. So you can have kind of a series of escalations to be interoperable with that. I think that when the time comes that these regulations come, our system will be better suited to be able to handle that in a more graceful way without requiring us to change the philosophy of the underlying ledger or forcing people to embed metadata. It's always going to be optional. So I think we'll fare better than most, but there are things that have to happen outside of the cryptocurrency space, uh, such as a central bank issuing a token or emergence of a standard asset like a, like a tether that people have faith in uh, that is somehow auditable and trusted. Uh, to be able to get to that that fiat interoperability. But I understand why everybody wants them. And this is how I entered the space. I mean, we were saying, well, if you can't have stability, you can't do lending. If you can't do lending, you can never get rid of the banks and you can never re reform remittances or, or reform commerce. So these things are, you know, great value stores and speculative instruments and perhaps pricing mechanism for a resource, uh, but they, they, aren't, uh, they aren't a replacement for the dollar until you get there. Well, wow, thank you for that answer, Charles. And you also touched on some questions that are going to come up further down the line here. And also, thank you, uh, Reddit user Line Likes Cookies. Philippe, over to you, sir. All right. So the next user is Zezman. And Zezman says, can you explain the Basho phase of the roadmap? I think a lot of people are under the impression that with the release of Shelly, Cardano is ready. Users are staking and scaling isn't a consideration anymore. What does Basho do for Card Cardano? in terms of scaling and what does its implementation look like? Thanks for your time and keep up the good work. Yeah, so I'll, I'll start with themes and then Charles, please jump in with some more details. So Basho is about scaling. We do think that even just with Shelly and Gogan, we'll have, uh, I don't wanna put numbers on the board, but we'll have some impressive performance numbers. But as Charles already said, that you, you don't ever stop. We'll never stop looking at scaling. Um, and so there's there's more approaches we can use. We already get a reasonable amount of scale because of the efficiency of the Ouroboros proof of, of stake uh, consensus algorithm. It, it, it is just naturally faster and more efficient. And so that helps a lot. But then on top of that, there's two kinds of scaling. And so one is, you know, think of the checkout lines in the supermarket. You just add more checkouts, right? So now you've got more people going through. And so that's horizontal scaling. Vertical scaling is when you add something in place to make one single line go faster. And those are vertical solutions. An example of a vertical solution is Lightning Network, which is, uh, 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 which is on Bitcoin and other, other networks, including Cardano, is, is looking at adding. And so um, that allows for things to go faster through one checkout line. And so uh, we're gonna, we're, we'll be focused on both. We will be both doing our own original research and, and looking at our own original solutions, but also adopting uh, uh, the best thinking from the industry. This is not gonna be a, a only invented here shop for those kind of things. There's a lot of really smart people working on those problems and we'll be uh, uh, looking at what they're coming up with. Yeah, we, we wrote some papers on this already. Um, you know, for cross-chair communication, it's really useful to have proofs that when you look at something coming from a foreign chain, whether it be a shard or it be an actual other blockchain, that you know what you're looking at is right, and you can validate that quickly. And that's the whole point of NEPA POWs and the point of proof of stake side chains. And then we wrote another paper called Parallel Chains, where we had a kind of a discussion of the relationship between latency and throughput and how these things can uh, be put into a kind of a trade-off profile. It's no longer the case where sharding is a greenfield, you know, let's go do something and invent, reinvent the wheel type of a deal. There are dozens of legitimate ideas and projects and peer-reviewed papers that already exist, in some cases already being implemented, that have very clear benefits, uh, whether that be rapid chain or that be uh, Omniledger or you know these types of things. They exist, they're real. And it's, it's not a question of, can we do this? It's now more so of a question of, what are we willing to give up to get there? Uh, for example, uh, you would want 
to still preserve a lot of Byzantine resistance, but you really can't be, do better than a third the minute that you shard. In some cases, you go down to a quarter, depending upon the nature of the algorithm. So we immediately go from 50% down, and that's probably okay, especially if you have other mechanisms within your system to, that help bridge that gap. The other thing is that when you're dealing with shards, generally you do admit some sort of a coordination committee. So uh, one of the properties you look for with shards is this concept of pairwise disjoint transactions. So what that means is that if uh, you, you take something in shard A and something in shard B, then they should not have overlap, meaning that Alice's transaction is in both of those shards. They should be disjoint from each other. They're completely unique. The only way that happens in practice is if there's some sort of serializer, some sort of committee that has a God's eye view of everything, and it makes proactive decisions about which buckets get to do various things. It also helps you coordinate communication between these so that you don't have this enormous overhead. Uh, so how you build that has a lot to do ultimately with the throughput of the system, the censorship resistant properties of the system, and also it's an additional bucket you have to incentivize. Uh, and there's there's unique security and privacy implications with these types of systems. Finally, as David mentioned, uh, you know, there's things you can do off the chain. Uh, Vitalik is dumping money into Starkware as his Intel Ventures and other big VC guys because Elie Ben Sassen and his guys are saying we can bundle lots of stuff together off chain with Star Starks and you can only validate a little thing on chain, but then you have all this magic happening somewhere else and we can get a more distributed system this way. And these are entirely reasonable approaches. So you have to not have a one-size-fits-all solution. Rather, what you do is you say, all right, what is the state of the art the ecosystem has? And that's what we're basically going to put a flag in the ground with Ouroboros Hydra, where there'll be a boatload of citations and a boatload of discussion about competing papers. And we make our decision of where's that sweet spot for trade-offs. And the nice thing is the Ouroboros design is quite easy to shard if we want to do that. And we'll just put that down there. And there's already some pre-theory that we've done. We're just cleaning up a few of these old things, like we're getting Ouroboros polished for journal submission, and we're uh, dealing with Kronos and Thos. Those are almost out. And then there's also uh, spikes of dishonest majority. And once we get past that, then the next very next thing is the sharding side of things. And that'll be done throughout the summer. But then after you put that flag in the ground, you say, this is the way we're going to do it. Then you have to say, okay, well, how do we want to make that 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 checkout line faster? And so uh, Rob Cohen, uh, he's one of our product managers, is working exclusively at analyzing the Lightning Network and seeing if we can add this in as an additional capability to Cardano. And then we're also looking very heavily at Snarks and Starks and other zero knowledge uh, and also MPC solutions. So we had a guy named Sandro, and he's a researcher out of um, uh, Switzerland, and he's basically looking at the MPC space and seeing if there's something we can bring in. And Markov Kohlweiss has already published something called Sonic, uh, but we have other zero-knowledge proofs that we're developing and other techniques we're developing. We're even implementing them, and we may be able to bring some of those techniques to do exactly what Eli Ben Sassen is doing with Starkware uh, for Cardano. So we're not picking a one-size-fits-all. Rather, we're saying, let's borrow as much as we can because this is mostly a solved problem at this point, and everybody's kind of converging to the same collections of solutions. Uh, and then let's add some unique twist that we think is uh, we get to do because Ouroboros was properly designed. Uh, and then for, let's clean up the mess a little bit. So let's make sure that we don't give up too much in the process of getting additional performance. Uh, so, uh, so that's what Basho is all about. Uh, and uh, it'll make the system very different. Uh, it'll make the incentive scheme a little different because you'll have additional actors to reward. You'll no longer have a thousand state pools. You'll have you'll actually have incentives to have a lot more. And then you'll have different kinds of actors that are doing different things. It'll add a lot more sophisticated crypto likely into the ledger. Uh, and then we'll also perhaps have uh, layer two solutions that come in alongside that. So the existence of lots of state pools make those systems more federated and faster. And that some composition of all these things will be Basho. So we'll get it started in 2020, but it's going to be a conversation the space is having for years, 2025, 2030. People are still going to be coming up with great innovations and great ideas. And uh, that's the advantage of having high, uh, lots of competition in a very fertile environment. And we're in a pretty good position because we, we kind of see everything. We go to every conference. Uh, we talk to every developer. So there's nothing at this point that's going to surprise us that just comes out. And they say, oh, my God, we didn't know this MacGuffin can solve everything. We, we know of these things. And we know that uh, researchers who are developing these things, like, for example, RapidChain is a very good sharded BFT protocol. 
when we presented Ouroboros Genesis at CCS, they presented right after us. Literally, the very next presentation was their presentation. So we literally could just walk five feet and go talk to these people that have been thinking about sharding for two years and have a deep and detailed conversation with them. And, and so we kind of know where the state of the art is. And it's just a matter of putting our flag on the ground of what are we willing to live with as an ecosystem without trading our principles. All right, Philippe, do you want me to take the follow-up question from Arcada19? Go for it. Go for it. Okay, thank you for that, Charles. That was from Zesman, a uh, Reddit user. We've got some great Reddit users over here on the Cardano Effect Reddit. And Marcada19 followed up directly with that question with what Charles just explained, and that was, there's a follow-up question related to Basho. Will Ouroboros Hydra be something like adaptive state sharding, which Elrond has introduced, or will Cardano or blockchain data structure in general be competitive against DAGs, and do you have any estimates for TPS after Basho. So very intuitive follow-up yeah. question there. Anything to add? So, you know, dad, dads are just a loaded term. You hear them everywhere. And it's like, dad, 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 dad. You know, you say, oh, wow, wouldn't it be great that everybody can make their own blocks? And I said, of course. Uh, but if we don't have a God's eye view and we're divvying up the work units the right way, then your block is going to look a lot like my block. So we're just doing the same thing twice and storing it twice within the system. And then we have to have a reconciliation for, for how do we handle conflicts? You know, so half the time you're just thinking about that. So the, the, the magic, the secret sauce is how do you serialize and chop up the work and, and handle that ordering? And then also how do you handle uh, the, 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 the cross shard communication? You know, and so there are many different philosophies on how to do this. And yes, if you're static versus adaptive, obviously if you're static where you say there's a fixed amount of shards, like a hundred, it's a lot easier to think and conceptually go about that. But any solution should be able to emit a dynamic system and be able to load balance accordingly. Now the advantage of Ouroboros is that if you're doing sharding across epics and you're running epics in parallel, that's like saying every epic is one of those checkout lines. And you're just saying, okay, well, you know, I'm going to open and close lines based upon uh, demand. So basically what you do, it's almost like a difficulty retargeting algorithm that uh, proof of work has, is that you just look at historical need. And if you're highly saturated, then you open up more of those checkout lines and then you route traffic accordingly. If you're not saturated, you shut down some of those lines to conserve resources for the system, meaning you elect less committees. And you can do this on, uh, you know, basically some regular consistency. So in the case of or Boris right now, it's every five days, we can come up with an even more adaptive system. And as long as you have cross shark communication, and as long as you have the ability to make sure that no two people are in this, are in uh, no one person's in two separate lines, uh, then you have a very efficient system. So we wrote a paper, Parallel Change, that does talk about this a bit. And Hydra will put a flag in the ground for how we handle these two things. And the sidechains paper also assists us with this. Uh, so I'd like it to be adaptive because then you could load balance and uh, then you have a system that elastically scales to its need up and down and other people are already pursuing that. So it doesn't seem to be like it's uh, too difficult of endeavor to, to pursue. Um, but there's a lot that goes into that. You know, the other thing is that you have to also talk about different transaction types. So uh, not transactions are not fungible. Uh, certain transactions are frankly more heavy and more valuable than other transactions. And so it's kind of nuts to say, we're gonna build a system where the billion dollars of Bitcoin is gonna be treated the exact same way as the five cent Bitcoin transaction. Uh, that you no know, nobody in the world would, would say that that's a reasonable thing. And analogously, your CryptoKitties application is probably not as important as a smart contract connected to maybe a mission critical power infrastructure or something like that. So you have to think about transaction priority. You have to also think about uh, basically uh, how do you do uh, transaction segregation to perhaps different systems which are custom built for those. Also, another thing is transaction privacy. So uh, Nightfall, for example, is a, a library that Ernst & Young just released for Ethereum where they're starting to introduce layer two privacy uh, to smart contracts. Well, you know, the, the, those are very heavy and they're very expensive within the gas model. You know, maybe there's going to be special lanes and special shards that accommodate that type of work or have special capabilities to do these types of things with different trust models. So from the base protocol, they don't look 
uh, very different from the other things, but then there's additional stuff there and you pay a transaction fee above and beyond a normal transaction fee to be able to use this, but it's a thousand times faster or maybe fast finality. Like for example, you don't want to wait 10 or 15 confirmations. You want to use a piggyback BFT protocol to get instant confirmation of the transaction. So when you're talking about adaptive sharding, you also kind of start talking around different highways so you don't just look at hor you don't look, just look at homogeneous shards. You start looking at heterogeneous shards, and you say that some of these may have actual different protocols running within them. They may have actual different privacy characteristics. They may have different transaction settlement time within them. There'll be reconciliation eventually, but in the short term, they they have these uh, these particular properties. So Hydra will put the flag in the ground of how we want to do that and how much we want to push into layer two. Uh, but it's a very complicated question uh, because there is no right answer. It's a, it's a, it's more of a philosophical and a and a business question than it is a technological question. The last four years, in particular, dozens and dozens of papers have been written that kind of explore this design space, and they kind of tell you what your options are. But you know, just because I can buy a truck doesn't mean I can buy. I need a truck. Maybe I need a, a sedan, or maybe I need an SUV, or maybe I have beautiful roads, and there's only me, so I get a Corvette. So you, you kind of need to decide based upon what you're doing, you know, uh, where you want to go. But all of those can be equally high quality vehicles, right? They can all be the top of the top line of great engineering. It's just they might not be suited for certain purposes. Interesting. Interesting. I think that's the word sharding is, I mean, I think it's a buzzword in cryptocurrency at this point. I think every single project in probably the top, I don't know couple hundred are all using the same terminology. So it will be interesting to see how this turns out. And obviously research and writing papers trumps everything. And that's what's going to allow you to make sure that you implement the best protocols for your particular blockchain project. But moving forward, we have another question. Um, Rick, we can move to the next question. Yeah. So the next one's from trade feeds. You can get that one. We got 14 questions left. How do you want to handle that? Speed round? Speed round? Yeah, we'll pick the. Uh, <laughs> we'll have David yeah. do a speed pick round. The, pick the best. Hey, David's much faster. Okay, pick the best like... ones. Rick, you want to do trade feeds question, or you want me to do it? Go for it. Okay, so trade feeds asks: Is the Cardano blockchain going to have the functionality of Yella and KVM, even without implementing them, or are these going to be replaced with some other technology, or are they just going to be proposed um, postponed for the time being? Definitely going to toss that one to Charles. <laughs> yeah, Yella, Yella, God, that's a frustrating one, guys. Uh, that was one of those go big or go home, uh, you know, uh, bets that we did. Um, anybody can do WebAssembly. Uh, you know, if EOS can do it, anybody can do it. And uh, anybody can do EVM. It's not hard. And so what we really wanted to do was go shoot for something that would have a very natural evolution so that first when we wanted to update the system, it would be super easy to update the system and not break all your tooling. Second, that when you wanted to add new language support, it didn't take six months to a year to write a compiler and, and now you have it. Uh, you just write a definition and then boom, you have it and semantics based compilation takes care of everything. So it was uh, probably the most sophisticated computer science and the, 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 the the riskiest bet of everything within the Cardano roadmap. So the original relationship with RV was to say, let's rewrite K because it's written by students and, and it's been touched by 65 different hands over the last 15 years. And uh, that's just a mess. So let's get a, a clean, concise, beautiful code base that has low technical debt and it's useful for integration and it's easy to add new features and functionality to it. So that's kind of some housekeeping. The second part was saying, okay, well, let's make the machine generated stuff fast and let's see if we can close that delta so that we're in one order of magnitude of handwritten code because it's a hundred times to a thousand times slower and the third part was saying well this semantics based compilation idea this idea that i can have a k program and another k program and i can just translate between them so for a practical example uh, Sebastian would be able to write 10 Java programs and we have semantics for Java and then somehow they can just end up working on Yella and he doesn't have to write a compiler or anything. It just magically works. It's 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 like the power of, of math. All right. Uh, so let demonstrate that SBC is fully automated for all language pairings that uh, K provides. So we put a bunch of money, bunch of time, bunch of effort, 
and we got a lot of really good things out of that project. A, we wrote the first set of formal semantics for Ethereum. It's ironic that Vitalik, with all of his money and all of his engineers, didn't ever bother to formally specify the system that tens of billions of dollars is running on. Uh, so we did that with RV, and they did a great job there. Second, we designed a completely new virtual machine that was much more in line with best practices called Yella, and that was based on LLVM, designed by the people who created LLVM, because the department chair of UIUC was the guy who did that for Apple. Uh, so uh, LLVM's been around for a long time, and it's much more standard. The tooling for that is much more understandable. And then C, uh, we, we did a lot of work along the rewrite of the K framework, the SBC research, and the machine-generated stuff. The problem is that the velocity and the de-risking of that particular research thread did not fit into the 2020 window. The other thing was RENA. Uh, the de-risking and the velocity of the research we were doing there didn't fit into that 2020 timeframe. So first, that meant that that was not the best path for interoperability with Ethereum. There are easier, less risky, less expensive uh, ways for us to get that into our ecosystem. B, it also meant that if we were to pursue this, it probably should be pursued with a longer time horizon and different funding sources. And we should probably bring a consortium to that. So there are projects like Elrond, for example, who are still carrying that thread. And we're actually gonna look for Horizon 2020 grants from the European Union and other things that may map into that, perhaps even a DARPA project that could map into that and allow us to do that on a longer time horizon, three to five years. Uh, but K is still an amazing piece of the technology and uh, there's a lot of magic there. And I have a huge amount of respect for Gregory Boshu and what he's done. Um, he almost reminds me of Neil Koblitz in that he has this idea of a future for a field and a lot, a lot of people took him seriously, but he ended up winning in the end. You know, the case of Neil, he said, hey, elliptic curve crypto is great. And it took years for people to take that seriously, even though it was 10 times faster and the proofs were 10 times smaller. I think you get like from 160 bit key, the same security as a 4K RSA key. So there was just this, there was just this path that he was on, and he was very dogged about it, had the discipline to carry it through. And Gregory's been talking about the concepts behind K for more than 10 years, and he's written tons of papers, and he's trained tons of graduate students who have now gone into academia and have their own students, and they're at big universities like CMU and MIT and Stanford, and people are starting to catch on to this. So we'd like to continue doing something there, but it's a separate question from Ethereum interoperability. Uh, there, probably the best path forward would be maybe integrating eWASM when it's ready uh, or just putting the EVM into a, a side chain of our system and then allowing people to do that. Now, as a, a little side note, because of Chimeric Ledgers, it is actually possible to have the Ethereum smart contract model live within Cardano SL if we wanted it to. It's another one of those business decisions, but there's nothing intrinsically uh, incompatible with having UTXO, Plutus smart contracts call and interact with Ethereum style account contracts and vice versa, and people being able to deploy code in those models. It's probably counterproductive because Ethereum is deprecating the EVM and moving away from it to WebAssembly. So if we did that, we'd probably move to either Yella or WebAssembly. And it's also just an open question of where does the industry as a whole want to go? So it's, it's, it's like all these questions that people ask, it, they're complicated questions and they have a lot of meat to them. But, you know, it's important to pull the research stuff and the high risk, high return, shoot for the moon stuff from the product stuff. You know, what David and I do is we sit down and we talk about, well, what can we realistically do by 2020? What can we have a high assurance of delivering to the customer and know it's going to work and it's going to be secure and have a good user experience that does not compromise our ability to innovate in the future. Uh, and uh, somewhere along the way, we'll figure that out. But right now, it's a Plutus game, and uh, that's fine because it's going to bring a whole new dimension to the cryptocurrency space. And Plutus in itself is actually quite flexible. You know, there's no reason we couldn't write other DSLs for that template Haskell model and even replace the Haskell side with JavaScript or other languages which is for the off-chain code and make that paradigm work well, or even perhaps even have solidity as the on-chain code and have that compiled to run on Plutus core. There's definitely a lot of things we could do uh, to get people behind it and get great applications built there and good tooling there. And then let's have a discussion about, well, where do we want to go in 2020, 2021? But I, I am still definitely interested in funding, uh, you know, the K's evolution and semantics-based compilations evolution. And, but the thing is, I'm not the National Science Foundation and I'm not DARPA, you, you know, 
And you know, at the end of the day, if I'm using project capital to do things, I have to put project capital into things that I feel are tangible and practical today or within 12 to 24 month time horizon. We've already exhausted the long tail research arm of the project. We spent three years on Ouroboros, for example. It would be intractable for me to go look for a sharding solution on that thread that took another three years. I have to have one that I can publish this year and implement by the end of next year at the very most. And similarly, it's not really practical for me to go and do a science experiment for the next three years, four years, five years, and say, this is the path for how we're going to get Ethereum interoperability. There are much better, much faster ways to do that uh, that uh, may make more sense. So we still talk to RV. In fact, Gregory sent me an email last week, and uh, we're actually now talking to the Elrond guys. We're going to set up a meeting with them to see what they've done with their GoK backend. And we're still very interested in the evolution of that technology. And I firmly believe that he's on a very good thread and 10 or 15 years, that's going to turn into something that's going to revolutionize the entire programming language space. Uh, but this is just, you know, the problem with being an entrepreneur and the problem with being product management. It's not the things you cancel that you don't like that define you. It's the things you cancel that you really love and you really want and you really would just to the core of your body would rather have in your roadmap that define your products. And you, you have to be willing to have the courage to cut those things out for the sake of delivering the whole thing and, uh, and coming back to them later on. Like Apple, for example, they really, really wanted to have Sapphire glass for the display screens. And they, they chased that tiger for a long time. And they really wanted to have an under glass anywhere on the phone fingerprint reader for a long time. They chased that dragon for a while, but they just realized it wasn't going to be practical within a reasonable time horizon. And so they had cut it, you know, and so this is this is where we're at. There are certain things that just won't make it into the 2020 roadmap. And that's definitely one of them. But it's a separate conversation from the Ethereum interoperability discussion. Yeah. And one thing I'd like to add to that, if I can, is that although iOS K was by far the primary funder of KVM, and as far as I know, the only funder of Yella, uh, both these technologies are written in K. And the, the core funding for K itself as a tool is not just iOS K. Obviously, Runtime Verification is a company who's based around improving uh, this K tool. And the benefit of having written KVM and Yella in K is that as Runtime, verif runtime Verification continues to improve the K ecosystem, we inherit all those benefits. So we can say, okay, maybe we're not here for now, uh, but as you know, runtime verification continues work on K, we inherit it all for free. So it might be uh, realistic to say in a few, uh, I don't know, like the time horizon in, in a while, uh, we inherit all those benefits and then it becomes much more tractable uh, to achieve this into the Cardano ecosystem. Right, and it's just it just makes sense to say that you write the semantics once for a language, you just put those on the blockchain, everybody gets them and then suddenly those programs now work in your system and all the tooling is interoperable uh, and every time you update the core virtual machine yella for example you go to yellow 2 or yellow 3 you don't have to rewrite any infrastructure it just all auto updates without any human participation that's magic and that's an enormous leap forward for uh, all of computer science it's like turning a ward level leap forward uh, and uh, if it works gregory definitely deserves to have one so you have to look at your commercial realities and you also have to look at federations and RV is an independent company. They get NSF funding, they get funding from other sources. I think Boeing is a client. Uh, and so they're going to continue doing their thing. And as they get richer, uh, they're certainly going to make that technology better. And at some point we will come back in and, and have a discussion about what is the best way to continue the research that we started. Um, and we'll probably do that with a federation and we'll probably do that with a longer time horizon. Uh, it's unfortunate that we couldn't get it into the 2020 roadmap. I really, really, really wanted it. And we spent a long time negotiating at the beginning of this year to, to try to find a way to make that fit within our budget, our time horizon. And we just couldn't get there. And that, I actually had people fly out and talk to them. And I talked to them. And uh, we, we worked really hard. And they flew out to, to Plutus Fest at the end of uh, 2018 in December. Uh, we, and we talked to them extensively. We got drunk together. We did everything in humanly possible to try to try to make that work, but it just didn't quite get there. And you know, that's just the way it is. Uh, so uh, we'll figure out Ethereum interoperability. That's that's easy, and uh, and then we'll come back to K at some point. Um, the other nice thing is that K's existence is causing other PL people to think about alternative ways to do what Gregory is doing. So there is kind of a convergence in the academic community towards this line of thought. 
and uh, and that's only going to continue over time, and it's going to the quality is going to improve, and the papers will continue, and at some point that that technology will be ready for productization, and we can bring that into our ecosystem when that makes sense. All right, thank you, Charles, Sebastian, and uh, Reddit user Trade Feeds. Thank you all for that. The next question comes from Crypto Herbalist, and Crypto Herbalist asks. What are your thoughts on large companies like Facebook that are getting into the space? Do you consider them a threat to decentralized platforms? Well, you know, David lives in the Valley. So, uh, you know, uh, David, you should probably take your Valley-esque uh, perspective. Uh, you know, bring it to all of us. <laughs> sure, sure. I'm not positive I have a Valley-esque perspective, but I'll offer mine. Um, <laughs> I, I think... Um, Rising tide raises all boats at the at the moment in in crypto and the decentralized app platforms. Um, uh, more exposure. There, there's still a, a large number of people kind of waiting to see, deciding if this if, if crypto in general has credibility and is going to be a thing. Uh, we all we all believe it's uh, going to be a big part of the future, but many people are still waiting. And so those kind of projects, they they add to that. You know, when you think about a large company, and there many many companies now are experimenting with small blockchain projects, sort of proof of concepts. And and they want to learn how it could affect their business. But most of them are kind of waiting. They want to see multiple viable, sort of a, a large mission critical enter enterprise class platforms that they could build on so that not even just one, they want multiple so that they can they can see this as a more mature industry. And they want the credibility of, uh, of the onboarding and offboarding platforms that something like a Facebook or a federally supported Currency like like uh, a stable coin like like Charles was mentioning. So I see the I see these things as helpful, um, and uh, and they they drive the industry forward. Yeah. So basically, they want to watch other people fail and then steal your developers. No, I'm just kidding. That's so, <laughs> that's what they do sometimes. Yeah, that sounds like a Silicon Valley move to me. That sounds like something that would, that would happen. Sorry. What did Aqua hire? <laughs> you know, and actually, it's kind of interesting that Silicon Valley isn't the leader of the cryptocurrency industry. They had an opportunity, but they didn't take it too seriously. And most of the major companies and most of the major innovation for cryptocurrency is actually done outside of Silicon Valley. For example, if you just look in the North American continent, uh, the two big hubs are Toronto and New York. Um, uh, not for, for, there are some prominent California-based companies like uh, Coinbase and, and Circle and so forth, but I mean, consensus is twice as large as both of them combined. And then Ethereum was created out of Toronto. Uh, and there's tons of great projects like Polymath and others uh, in those domains. And most of the good entrepreneurs that I, I work with are actually in Asia or they're in Europe. Uh, so there is a bit of catch up that the Valley has to do. And, Furthermore, these large tech companies, usually the reason why they haven't entered or been resident to enter our space has come from regulatory reasons. It's just not clear what the regulations are going to look like, not just today, but the next five years, 10 years, 15 years. Remember, when you're Facebook, you don't just ask the question of what is the Securities Exchange Commission going to do? You're building a decision matrix where you're saying if Trump loses the 2020 election and this particular candidate wins, uh, what type of person would they put in charge and what would financial regulation look like and how will that impact and then you you make them contingent like what what if the european union does this and how will this work and if you're facebook you're in 100 different jurisdictions uh just today i, I read that there's potential law being passed in india uh, that could ban the use of cryptocurrencies and if you use them you get 10 years in jail whether that passes or not that fits into your calculus because you'd be in compliance in the united states but then you would be out of compliance in India. So then you have to figure out how do you localize these types of things? And, you know, does it make business sense? So they have a lot more to lose and they're regulated companies. They're public companies. They're subject to surveys. Actually, they're, they're subject to all kinds of reporting requirements that I'm not subject to. And so that by definition means they have to move in a more methodical way. And in many cases, that means that they'll build an internal research and development group They'll come up with all kinds of crazy ideas that are magical, and they have a lot of great engineers, so they can build things on par with what we can build. But then those things tend to just sit on the shelf until eventually they say, okay, we're fine. Let's go do this. And now, there are some bellwethers that tell you that companies are getting more comfortable. Microsoft deploying an identity management system on Bitcoin 
is a huge bellwether. That's that's a big step forward. It legitimizes a lot in our space. Uh, Ernst and Young and Deloitte and PwC, the auditors, actually building audit solutions with blockchain technology or for cryptocurrencies is another big step forward. It means that tax compliance and these types of things are becoming more resolved matters. And then finally, of course, Facebook announcing it's going to launch its own token. That means that they did the calculus within that company that uh, that this makes sense. And what that means is that competitive pressures will now force Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and other entities into the space within the next 24 to 36 months. And so that will become a community best practice. And so that's the real competition because you're going to have wallets built right into Microsoft Windows or right into Google. Uh, and they might have a cloud wallet in Gmail or something like that. And wow, now they have 2 billion users. Uh, and they have very sophisticated tools to make these things great and great user experiences. Uh, so that's going to be a lot of fun to compete with. This is why, for example, we've chosen a pan-African and a pan-Asian uh, view uh, because you know, we're not really competing much with IBM or Microsoft or Deloitte or these other guys in those jurisdictions. Um, they won't touch those markets. So we can end up getting hundreds of millions or billions of users, despite the fact that Facebook can have 2 billion users. And that's a unique USP to Cardano. Meanwhile, the EOSs of the world and the Ethereums of the world are desperately trying to absorb as many users as possible to try to get to a scale where they, they, they will stand a chance to survive that coming tsunami wave of incumbents that will, uh, that will be quite difficult to compete against. In many cases, we'll enjoy unfair regulatory advantages, unfair banking advantages, or, or in some cases, be able to alter the law to make their products basically the only products that can function, whereas these emergent upstart cryptocurrencies may be washed out. Meanwhile, that's not going to happen in Ethiopia or in Mongolia or in Uganda or these other core markets that we're exploring. We feel that we'll be first to market. and The demographics actually line up quite nicely for them to go along with us. Uh, so, you know, this, it's just fun to watch, though. That's what makes these things exciting. I mean, if you pick any decade of technology, whether that be 1990, 2000, 2010, it's damn near impossible to predict who's going to be on top and who's going to be the most relevant company. If you took somebody from 1995 and you said, prediction, what is the most sexy, relevant technology and company for 2005? Uh, the 1995 person would probably say Microsoft. And then you go to 2005, they'd probably say Google. And if you go to 2015, they'd probably say Facebook or something like that, you know, or Tesla. You know, what is it going to be in 2025? Who knows? Maybe it's an AR company. Maybe it's Neuralace. You know, BCI is like the big thing. Uh, so uh, this this creative destruction tends to open up opportunity for everybody. But you do have to think in trends. You do have to think in markets. And you do have to understand that at the end of the day, we tend to move at the speed of regulators. Uh, when I joined Polymath as an advisor, it was astounding to me the requirements, the business requirements, the regulatory requirements that go into their product development. I mean, like literally, they have to think about securities laws in dozens of countries and think really carefully about uh, basically how do we keep all these people happy and, and and deal with imaginary boogeymen that could come five years later and retroactively say everything that's been built is somehow out of compliance and therefore no one can use it. Uh, so when your thought process is along those lines, you're really not thinking much about moving fast and breaking things. You're thinking a lot more about how do you play the, the regulatory game? And I'd much rather play that in jurisdictions that are greenfield markets and I can have influence over regulation or even change laws than play it in places where somebody can put $100 million into lobbyists and then suddenly make my entire business model illegal, as we saw what happened with the payment service providers back in the 90s and the 2000s and so forth. And the Eagle guys went to jail as a result. Yeah, thank you for that answer, Charles. And I would like to add to any of our viewers who are still watching this podcast after an hour and 50 minutes that if you uh, if you would like to see greater crypto adoption and you live in the United States, feel free to write your members of Congress. You can write them a very polite letter and say, hey, you'd like to see cryptocurrencies used. And if enough people do that, maybe eventually you'll get some. I was telling Philippe a story right before this podcast about um, myself writing members of Congress, and it does work. Uh, it just takes a course of people, many people writing, and if they hear enough of it, it'll get their attention, and then it will help Charles out with his endeavors when he goes and talks to these government people. They go, oh, yeah, I've heard of that, and I think that might be a good idea. My constituents have written me letters about that, and so that might be a helpful thing to do. What do you think, Charles? That sound good? Yeah, and also I'd highly recommend knowing who the good guys are. Like, I'm a huge fan of Coin Center. I think uh, Jerry Brito and his 
this group are just doing great work and they actually have real access to politicians. Every time the Senator of the Congress talks about cryptocurrencies, they end up usually briefing the senators and the congressmen and they make policy recommendations all the time and uh, they're mostly in line with uh, where the industry is going. And there are other think tanks like the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard and so forth. But generally speaking, you know, writing Congress is, is a tool. We, we did that in the old days. You might remember the audit the Fed movement with, uh, with Ron Paul. It wasn't so effective there. I mean, we got overwhelming support from Congress, but those banking committees were still super hard to deal with. It was amazing when a supermajority of Congress supported something, it still would not be brought to the floor for a vote because of nepotistic corrupt politicians. But uh, generally speaking, we are seeing good effects. Like for example, the recent legislation in Wyoming, laws being passed Montana, Colorado, the states are leading and they are forcing the government to come to terms with the fact that the, the FinCEN's money service business and the state money service business regulations are badly out of date, need to be updated. Securities law is badly out of date, needs to be updated. And just compliance regulation in general is, is, is very bad. It's, it's asset-based, entity-based, and it should be functional and transaction-based, and it should be programmable. And the government should be in the business of writing libraries and APIs and things to plug into instead of the business of saying, we're going to give you ambiguous stuff that only the divinity of lawyers can decode and then even after you've done all the work we can still say no for no reason or never even tell you and if you get it wrong we can retroactively come and punish you it's just a super bad model it's a very 20th century model when everybody was in the old boys network and if you had questions about it you go take him to dinner it doesn't map well to a fast-paced global environment uh, so writing your congressman certainly is helpful and also knowing your policy groups like Coin Center is certainly helpful and uh, just just being a reasonable evangelist for certain things. Um, and also when certain members of the political class behave badly, like there was a congressman recently who said we should ban all cryptocurrencies because they depowered the U.S. government, we should humiliate these people and we should brutalize them in the, in the court of public opinion. Uh, you know, and point out the hypocrisy and the fact that these people are anti-freedom. And these people desire all of us to be in economic chains and controlled by a small group of overlords. Uh, so when they do this, send money to people who are doing a primary challenge and send money to their uh, opponents and, and campaign for their opponents. That's really the only way to get Congress to listen. Uh, if they think that they do something and there's a high probability that this will make their primary significantly more difficult or will make their election significantly more difficult, those are the kinds of decisions that they take very seriously. Uh, if they're in a safe jurisdiction and you know every they win 70% of the vote, like Nancy Pelosi, then they don't really care at all about what people say. 95% of the world can be against with them. They're still going to win re-election. So there's no real consequence to uh, to that. But if they're in a shaky jurisdiction and that vote could mean the difference between them keeping their job or losing their job, the very fact that a tsunami wave of money and positive support will go to people opposing them if they take that step, and they know that, will make them much more inclined to be actually on the side of the right side of history and, and make good choices and make good decisions. But it's it's just very frustrating. Another last point, I, you know, because I've been in the political space for so long, there is a fourth branch of government in the United States. It's the bureaucracy. And unfortunately, it doesn't matter who's the president or who's in Congress and the Senate. A lot of the decisions about the implementation of policy and the things that affect your life are actually controlled by unelected bureaucrats who have no fear of losing their job and no consequences when they make bad decisions. If you're wrongfully arrested, if you're wrongfully prosecuted, if they try to fine you for something, for example, the Securities Exchange Commission, let's go through the kick example. Let's say kick is right and they go fight this SEC for years and they win. The best case scenario is dismissal with prejudice. Well, the SEC will say, well, we still think we're right and oh well, let's just move on. Now, kick cannot recover any of the legal fees that they've spent. So they could spend $5 million, $10 million, $15 million defending themselves, and they win, okay, great, but they don't get any money back, and the SEC just moves on. And the people who brought that enforcement action keep their jobs, keep their salaries, in many cases get promoted and moved up the chain. So this is the other side of government that really does need to be reformed, and it's, it's quite problematic that there isn't a proper accountability feedback loop. If I'm a private company and I go after another company, let's say for patent infringement lawsuit, I lose that. 
I suffer a consequence for that. I, I, I have to pay a bunch of money. I have to pay their legal fees and I get a brand damage and no one wants to partner with me and I'm called a patent troll. And also the employees who brought on that, I'm probably going to fire them because they made such a horrendous mistake. And the government, they just say, oh, well, you lose some. Yeah, just move on. Let's keep going and doing these things. Uh, and in a lot of cases, they even get rewarded in private industry. Like Ben Lossky, he created BitLicense. And it, it just devastated the entire New York crypto environment. Now everybody pulls out of New York because no one wants to be there. And what was his reward for destroying an entire industry in a state? He's now on the board of directors of Ripple. And he's making buku money in the private industry. And at some point, he'll go back into politics and climb the ladder and be able to uh, to do something even bigger. Maybe he'll become mayor of New York. You know, so this is this is the reality that we really need to to focus on. And you know, the congressmen are one component, the policy groups are another component. And you have to think carefully about incentives. And there does need to be reform of the civil service in the United States, in particular. And if we can't get it done, well, then we need to promote offshoring and, and get it done in Switzerland and other places and just economically leave behind the United States. Uh, it's, uh, it's a frustrating thing, guys. And I live it every day. And every person in our space lives it every day. And it's just so fucking disheartening uh, when the CEO of Chase calls me a criminal, you know, or, or, you know, Warren Buffett says we're all a scam or something like that. When we're the guys who actually have a solution to bring financial services to 3 billion people who are being totally ignored by the legacy system, or we're the guys who can actually bring some automation and trust and credibility and competition into financial systems so you don't have to pay 10% fees or 15% fees just to simply move money to the poorest people in the world, or you don't have these predatory loans at 35% interest. They're the criminals, not us, and yet we're being called that and our industry is being pushed into that, uh, into that ballpark. So it's, uh, yeah, I just hope we get big enough and rich enough that we eventually have a voice and we can fight. But I do worry a lot about the Microsofts and the Facebooks and the Amazons because they're not philosophy-driven companies. Uh, they're companies that are driven by profit and by shareholder returns. And ultimately, they live within a regulatory environment that is nepotism and cronyism, modify the government's DNA so that they can survive, but it becomes a toxic environment for the rest of us. And, uh, you know, we just have to... We just have to work our way through that. It's tough. All right. Thank you, Charles. That's my soapbox rant for the day. You remind <laughs> me of a you remind me of a young Ron Paul. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we got that. His name is Rand Paul. <laughs> Rick, we have like a dozen plus questions left. So we do, we got twelve left. <laughs> yeah. Uh, How about we just go for another 20 minutes and then we clip it at 2.30. Okay. That sounds good. <clears throat> okay. So I'll get into the next question then. Um, from United King Dada and says, uh, absolutely adore this project. I've invested in and followed since the start. I've noticed over the last two weeks, there has been an undercurrent of discontent regarding the Cardano Foundation and its current involvement from industry spectators. Obviously, they are independent, but surely they have a voice concerning the roadmap, positively or negatively. We do not hear anything from the people that are employed within the foundation. Are there any reasons for this, or is it too early in the project for them to have a meaningful impact? Please comment. Yeah, that was kind of unfair about the Cardano Foundation is that Amerco had years to grow and I had years to grow and the product had years to grow. And, and we were showing up every day and watering those crops and watching them grow. Uh, and meanwhile, Michael Parsons was just dousing them in gasoline and setting them on fire and then pouring salt on the earth after, after that happened. So, you know, we wake up three years later and I have this beautiful tree and Amerco has a tree and there's just barren earth. Uh, salted earth uh, with the foundation and it was really tragic and we had to wait for it to get so egregious that there was real possibility of a regulatory event to remove Parsons from the foundation because he was blatantly violating the mandate uh, that the system was created with. So Amergo and IOHK, uh, you know, you, know, you got to big kudos to Ken Kodama. You know, we took the chance to air the dirty laundry to the general public and say it has gotten to the point where there is no possibility of reconciliation, the policy is regime change. Uh, Parsons has to be removed and he has to be replaced with competent people who can retill the ground, remove the salt, remove the gasoline, remove all these things and plant seeds that can eventually grow. 
The problem is that now that that process is underway, people tend to compare the foundation to my tree, Anna Murgo's tree. I mean, Sebastian wakes up every day with Nico and a great team of people, and they built Seiza and Uroi, and they have wonderful things that they've done. They brought great products to market because these things were planned a long time ago, and it took them a huge amount of effort to build these things out. So right now, the foundation is doing its best. It's cleared the ASA issues. It's cleared its audit issues. It's now a sustainable, stable organization. And it's actually just talking about stuff it should have talked about in 2017, in 2016. And they'll accelerate it and they'll work super hard. But then again, we don't want to get into another parsing situation. So what do you do? You have to only move as quickly as you can. So in the meantime, we've been picking up the slack. I was never in my contract given money to do community management. It's not my job. We were never given support contracts to run a help desk or talk to exchanges about how to integrate Cardano. It was not in the contract, but we do these things. And it costs me hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars, every single year to do these things because the foundation was not doing them. And we will continue to do these things at IOHK until the foundation's capable of taking them over. Uh, so, you know, their lack of progress frustrates me more than anything else, because uh, at the end of the day, that if, if I knew the way it was going to end up, we would have just done it at IOHK. And after it was all done, built an entity and transferred everybody over. The whole reason we had it done with a third party is that there are conflicts of interest for IOHK and Amerco doing these things. We should not be the voice for the community. We have a conflict of interest there. We're a for-profit private company. We should not be talking to exchanges about listing. Uh, that's a conflict of interest. There's a whole bunch of things we should not do that the foundation should be doing. And at some point they will do these things. Now I've seen real progress. I, you know, I've seen good seeds planted. There's a new executive director who will be coming on board soon. And I hope to meet with that person soon and, and talk about the roadmap and the strategy. But it is at some point reasonable to start holding the foundation accountable, demanding their own roadmap, demanding their own philosophy, demanding a well-diversified board, uh, demanding financial transparency and uh, demanding for them to do the things that they were brought in to do. Uh, I shouldn't be writing the CIP process. That's what's going to ultimately decentralize the ecosystem's development side. That should be the foundation's job. We'll do the initial version, but they'll become the custodian of it. And so we'll work as hard as we can. I know Amurgo's working as hard as they can. We're in constant contact with Minmeet Singh and, uh, and Ken about these issues. And at some point in the future, uh, we'll see crops sprout up. And, you know, in some cases, it's going to take the community's patience and community's time to water those crops and help them grow. At the end of the day, it's as much your foundation as it is mine, as it is other people. Its purpose is to be here for the Cardano uh, uh, ecosystem participant, whether they be a, a, a person on the development side, or they be a regulator, or they be a, you know, a, an infrastructure provider. The foundation's raison d'etre is to be your representative and help you. And it's only as good as the people who are watering those crops. And because it's stunted, we all need to start investing some resources and we all need to be a little bit patient with it. But you know, at the end of the day, sometimes it doesn't work. And you have to actually look at the arc of history in cryptocurrencies. Uh, Bitcoin Foundation was a miserable failure. Uh, it was rife with nepotism. It, it had misuse of funds. I think they had 15 million in funding. They spent all of it. Uh, they're hiring their friends and family. It was just a terrible situation. Meanwhile, Bitcoin went to $20,000 and changed the entire world, and I'm beating camel herders who own it. So while the Bitcoin Foundation didn't do its job, it was unnecessary for Bitcoin's ultimate success. So we view the Cardano Foundation ultimately as an accelerator and as a standardizer and as a, a neutral referee to help the ecosystem along. But, you know, just like if you lose a kidney, you have another one to help you survive, and sometimes that kidney grows bigger and it just keeps you going. And Amurgo and IOHK, I think we're carrying a lot of weight. And uh, if the foundation ultimately is ineffective, it's a good case study of what can go wrong in governance. Uh, and if it is effective, then it's a good case study on how to reverse bad trends and purge bad behavior and turn it into an effective entity. But ultimately, I don't think it's going to be the deciding point whether Cardano as a project succeeds or fails. Um, I will tell this, one, one more point about that. Uh, Tezos... We never had a Tezos situation. You know, they, they, the money was locked up. It was an existential threat to the project. There was never a moment in any, no matter how bad it got, 
that the foundation's lack of performance was an existential threat to the project. Mature people got together and they did the right thing, even when it cost them money uh, to do the right thing, and they and they would take arrows in their back, and we got it done. And the, the scandal of the foundation was a non-scandal. There was no Reuters article or Wall Street Journal investigative journalist or you know, uh, you know, daily issue and, and, and everybody's questioning whether the project's going to survive. And frankly, most people don't even think about it anymore. It's a closed matter. It's a closed issue. And we're just moving on. They're more frustrated that the foundation's supposed to be there for them and it's not doing the things that it's supposed to do. Like a small example, why should IOHK have to sponsor the Cardano effect? We love you guys. We love the work you do. But there is kind of a little bit of a conflict of interest with my, my entity giving you guys money. I mean, we put an organizational firewall and we don't tell you what to say and what to do, but just the mere perception of IOHK sponsoring this uh, this podcast could make people interpret that somehow there's some sort of secret you know, understanding we have. Whereas if the foundation had given you guys a grant to do this, it would be pure money and you'd be beyond reproach. But that's a small example of one of the things they should be doing that they're just currently not doing. And I hope that when the new executive director comes on board, some of the things we can add on the agenda is a, a transfer of the guard of these types of things into that particular camp so that we can get uh, more peer funding, more diversity, and I can focus exclusively though on delivering Shelley and Goga because it's a hugely difficult job. David hasn't slept in months. And I think he came in as a 40 year old guy now, David, what are you, 65, <laughs> 75? You know. and, and how, how old is your kid? How, how old is your daughter? She's like 18 months, 19 months. What's that? 20, 20 months, 21 months. Oh God, 20 months already, you know, and, and on a houseboat. I don't know how this guy does it. I, I would I would hang myself in the shower. So uh, <laughs> that, that's all That's all I'll say about the uh, the foundation in that respect. It's, it's one of the most frustrating moments of my life. And it, it's just a great example of what happens when greed and stupidity uh, undermine and damage good things that people are trying to do. That said, every good ecosystem has these issues. Bitcoin had Mt. Gox, it had Silk Road, and it's had dozens of other events, and it's still here. When you can survive the bad times and the bad events and the crises and come out at the other side stronger, then oh, people have faith that this ecosystem is going to be here tomorrow. So I'd like to believe if there's any you know, you know, kind of uh, light at the end of the tunnel for what's happened, it has indicated that when a bad event happens, the ecosystem is going to come together and it's going to solves it one way or another. We'll just uh, create the evidence that Cardano is going to get where it needs to go. Yeah, and if I, if I can add to that also, uh, the CF is, is improving. It's not like, you know, it, it changed leaderships and then nothing really happened. And Nathan Kaiser, who's a chairperson, is going to a lot of conferences, a lot of countries, talking to a lot of governments and organizations. Uh, from the tech side, the ledger in integration to Cardano, although uh, Mergo did the implementation along with Vacuum Labs and IOHK. Uh, the Cardano Foundation did play kind of an oversight role into the project, and that's why all the ledger uh, code that was written lives into in the Cardano Foundation GitHub. Uh, the Cardano Foundation also helped uh, with some funding for CESA for some stuff we're going to be announcing in the future. And also, when the, the whole CF stuff was happening, uh, mostly it was uh, Mergo and IOHK that's doing all the community management, uh, you know, on the Telegram, on the forums. Uh, but the CF recently hired uh, people from the community who have a, a huge depth of experience in managing these platforms, understanding what's going on. And I think they'll do a, a great job with the task they now have as a full-time job as opposed to, to as a volunteer. So the CF is is uh, ramping up its activities. We're on the right path and we're moving forward. Yeah, I would I would echo that, Sebastian. I, uh, the, in terms of trajectory, I mean, I'm a newbie, but I meet with them regularly. Uh, we, we accomplish things together. We're collaborating well. Uh, they're contributing and contributing more and more all the time. And so uh, it's headed in the, in the right direction. Yeah, and we'll get there. Uh, I mean, uh, I am a bit harsh uh, because I just bad blood and bad experiences, but I, I have faith in Nathan and Domino and Manit, and I do see improvements every single day. It's just hard because you're behind, you know, and uh, we've made mistakes too. We hired Sarah Kell to do Byron and that didn't work out so well for us. And I, I have millions of dollars that I've had to spend, probably $10 million in, in 
development fees and lost time uh, to clean up that mistake. That's the cost I bear. And, uh, you know, it is what it is. Uh, so similarly, uh, you know, the foundation is where it's at. And there are very good people there who wake up every day and they want to do a good job. They want to be productive. They, they believe in the vision of Cardano and they feel that uh, they can add value and contribute. It's just they're being held to very harsh standards because they're told that they have to run at 100 miles an hour when they when they have no means to do so. So by definition, they're never going to measure up to that uh, to that unrealistic expectation. So I think the community does need to moderate a little bit. And what we need to do is is pick and choose our battles and focus with laser precision on certain things that need to get done over the next six months to 12 months. And I think we can accomplish those things. And then we can kind of hit a stride and build some pride. It was the same for Emergo. You know, before you Roy came along, there was many different things they were experimenting with, many different jurisdictions that they were in. And then Uroi came and it really focused the company. And it gave the company a clout and a, and a stride that just wasn't present there before. And it's a very different company to work with. And the employees are they're sometimes the very same people. They're different people to talk to, and they're much more productive and effective. So the foundation needs some wins. And the community needs to work with the foundation, help them get those wins. And then it'll get remoralized. And then over time, we'll see a lot of acceleration. And at some point, they'll they'll be effective, I hope. Uh, so uh, this new executive director has to lead. And um, I really hope that uh, this director is going to write a, a nice blog explaining who he is, where he comes from, his how he's going to help execute the vision. And I will have unlimited accessibility with that executive director to help that person along, as will David, as will all the people on our side explain the product and what we can and cannot do. I'm sure Mirko will have unlimited accessibility with him as well. Uh, and then uh, that person's job is to try to till that soil and get you know the, the, those crops growing double time. Uh, he'll be a, a bastion of a lot of criticism. But you know, you know, Ethereum had its hard times too. Ming, uh, under her leadership, the relationship between consensus and the Ethereum Foundation uh, really soured, and it got so bad. I believe that the consensus couldn't even sponsor one of the dev cons, and there, and it was just amazing. You know, you, you, your primary entity that's adding enormous value to your ecosystem somehow, some way, is viewed as an enemy of the project rather than a value add for the project. And those days are now just, just gone. You know, the, the Ethereum looks back at them as, oh, those were the bad days. And now they're thirty million dollars of investment, in setting up labs, and giving grants to all these people. And they have a clear, articulated vision, and they're under much better leadership. So that's an example of an organization that nearly went bankrupt, that was alienating members of its community and just not really getting along and shedding off people. Like Gavin got pushed out, and other people got pushed out. That has now turned the ship and it started to bring everybody back in to the extent where they even talk to the Ethereum classic community and they try to find ways to, to work with them. Whereas that, that kind of dialogue was just even impossible 12 months ago. So um, anything could be turned around. And I do see a lot of evidence within the Cardano Foundation of it being turned around. Nathan Domino and Mead have very particular skills to help resolve the bad soil that Parsons left. But then there needs to be other people who are real farmers uh, who will come in and make sure that those fields produce good crops and that just takes time by the way i live on a ranch and that's why i like these uh these agricultural references if i lived on a boat i'd probably have a lot of nautical references <laughs> yeah that's a good analogy and uh thank you charles sebastian and david for those last ones i'm going to summarize the next two questions because they've already been answered <clears throat> um the last one was from United King Data. The next two is uh, we got one from RJ Infosec, and he asks, or he or she asks, what are your thoughts on uh, Facebook's global coin in general? So that's already been touched on the question after that. So uh, thank you for that, RJ Infosec. And the question after that is still reading T42 to note that they would like the new road, uh, they like the new roadmap, but they would also like to see things like a check mark to indicate those in progress not yet started given their own symbols. So basically symbols to indicate status and also progress bars to indicate some percent complete, uh, even without <laughs> percentages, ETAs. And so it's kind of like the old roadmap, yeah. but that's okay. It's still good input. So I'm going to go on to the next question down from Reddit user 
university and we'll just make note that david is now aware of those inputs those are very good inputs and i think they could make note of it so reddit user university notes that um for most people one barrier to entry into the crypto world is converting fiat into crypto and back do you guys have any plans to address this and do you envision as possible solutions to make it less painful to buy ADA and convert it back to cash? Uh, your, it's another example of, of, of a foundation question, right? You know, the foundation's job is to drive adoption, make ADA easier to use, make ADA more interoperable with the ecosystem. I'm a technology company. David and I can sit down and spend the weekend talking until we're blue in the face about how to build particular things. Uh, but then at the end of the day, if you want to be interoperable with debit cards, and ATMs, and fiat infrastructure, you have to negotiate those deals. And either that's going to be done for a particular company, for a particular private interest. So Ergo can certainly do it to benefit themselves or you know, perhaps be a charity and benefit the ecosystem. But ultimately, you need a not-for-profit to basically worry about everybody. And either that's a treasury, which is coming, or it's a foundation, which is kind of the proto-treasury. It's kind of the initial impulse for these types of things. Uh, so uh, I'd love to see fiat, uh, more fiat on and off ramps. It organically comes because of greed. Uh, people who have these on ramps profit from their existence. And if you get large enough, there's large enough volume, they integrate because they can make millions of dollars from their existence. But if you want to accelerate that a little bit, um, then you know it's definitely... Uh, you know, for example, a very large blockchain company that controls a very large cloud wallet and the largest, one of the largest explorers approached us and said, for X amount of this, we could get you parity with Bitcoin in our system. That's a great example of something that would be in scope for discussion at the Cardano Foundation. I'm not going to pay for that. I'm not going to open my wallet and spend $5 million or $10 million for that. I, I was paid to build Cardano. And if I'm going to spend $5 million, I'm going to spend that money funding the K framework or Rena uh, or any of these things I've had to cut because we've had to make the budget a little bit more concise or exploring experimental R&D, for example, multi-party computation or something like that. And, you know, Amergo, if they're spending that, there has to be, you know, some sort of return on that particular investment. There has to be a commercial path where that allows them to stay in business 10 years, 20 years, 30 years down the road. Uh, so there are there are entities, there is really a purpose for something like a treasury or like a foundation. And these types of questions fall in that that lane. The how do we get more on and off ramps? How do we get ATMs throughout an entire country? How do we get debit or credit card support? Um, how do we get this particular exchange to list us? Or, uh, you know, how do we market this particular jurisdiction or, you know, do an airdrop or these types of things? Uh, that's the foundation's responsibility. So the new executive director comes in. This is the exact question you should ask him is, what are your priorities? What do you, what's a win for you? Where do you want to go? Where do you want to take it? Um, you know, in uh, year one, what is a priority? Year two, what is a priority? And so forth. And what do you envision will organically come into market as a consequence of Cardano just getting bigger and having a very lucrative user base to tap into? And what do you feel we're going to need to make strategic investments in to bring into the space because there are barriers there that just won't be crossed by organic adoption? Anything you want to add to that, David? Uh, no, I think that's a great answer, Charles. Yeah, I, I can add to that from the Emergo side. So like Yoroi, we announced our new slogan at the IHK Summit, which was, uh, you know, your gateway to the financial world. And that's kind of the vision we want for Yoroi. And we're working our best to make that easy for companies. For example, uh, in D-Lab, our accelerator program, uh, we launched Socian, which is a API for people to connect to to basically connect to a Cardinal full node as an API, right? And for Yoroi, we are also contributing code back to the WebAssembly bindings for Cardano. And whenever a company re comes out to us and says, we want to build something on Cardano, we say, okay, well, if you take the WebAssembly bindings that we're helping to write, plus Socian, which we helped fund, you've got a pretty good uh, framework for building uh, Cardano support. Uh, but the, at the core of our company, we're you know, not a regulation company where you know, a venture capital arm of the Cardano project, right? And so what we prefer to do instead is work with companies like Minaps Plus, which did the Cardano crypto card in Korea, which allowed you to, you know, use your card to pay with ADA. And we prefer to partner with these companies that have the domain expertise in their jurisdictions 
and provide them our knowledge of the protocol and the, our business solutions to, to kind of do a pairing. And so we're, we're doing the best we can from our side, but obviously no one company can do everything. So we need uh, partners to work with. Thanks for that, Sebastian. That was a, that was a great response by all three of you. Um, I think we're going to wrap this up because we have quite a few questions left. So I wanted to give David the floor to maybe say some last words about the roadmap or the test net that's upcoming. Um, I wanted to thank all the viewers of the Cardano Effect. Thanks for leaving all these wonderful questions on Reddit. If we didn't get to your questions on Reddit, we're sorry. Uh, maybe we'll table those and get to them another time. But this was a marathon episode, and I want to make sure that David has a little bit of time <laughs> to sum up everything and sum up maybe these last things that he wanted to say about the test net and the roadmap. So thank you, Charles, and thank you, David. David, the floor is yours. Thank you, Phil. Well, so um, keep checking back at the roadmap. Um, and you'll see an announcement about testnet coming soon. Um, and check back at the roadmap. You're going to see both more content and also more status. You're going to see quite a lot of it, actually. And so um, you'll see that on a regular basis. And so go there and and uh, and see what we're doing. Especially see see it's really exciting to see the developers uh, um, demonstrate what they've just built. This is real hard, real re real results building things that in many cases have never been built before in the world. And so, so stop back often, check out what we've got going on there. You're going to see more content coming. You're going to see Gogan, you're going to see Basha, you're going to see Voltaire, and you're going to see a lot of status. And then through separate channels, you'll see, you'll see the testnet coming soon. So there's a lot, lot coming. We're excited to show it to you. And uh, for those we who we didn't get to your questions, apologies. And you know what we mentioned, there's going to be AMAs coming up. So so uh, uh, keep them handy, and we'd be happy to answer those next time in uh, in an AMA. And I have that a question for you guys, uh, you know, because you asked us all these questions. So I think it's only fair that we ask you guys a question. It's uh, it's a very unique question. Uh, it's if you were a cookie, what type of cookie would you be? <laughs> I'd be a cho chocolate chip cookie because that's what the Cookie Monster eats. All right. <laughs> there you go. What about you, Philippe? Uh, oatmeal raisin. I like raisins. <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. I, I really like the oatmeal raisins. If I go purely by, by taste, that's definitely what I'd be. Uh, I, I really like the the oven baked ones where you can you know see it rise. I, I feel like that's you know if if I go for the metaphor, that's a good one. Yeah, <laughs> the cookie Rorschach test. <laughs> yeah. And what Charles, about you, Charles? What? Yeah. What about you? Oh, shortbread. Come on now, sir. Okay, David. <laughs> what about? I'd be an internet browser cookie. I mean, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the, the uh, Mark next. Mark Drace up with that. Was it fit, sir, for him? <laughs> <laughs> the next AMA, we need to do a, a Charles Hoskinson reverse AMA where you the one you ask the world questions and people got to dial in on chat and telegram and they got to <laughs> they got to answer your questions. <laughs> right. Well, you know, like, you know, uh, you you have to throw in these non sequitur, crazy questions from time to time. There's actually a story. Uh, sadly, it comes from Eric Weinstein, uh, where uh, Ben Affleck and Matt Damon, uh, they were young writers at one time. They were shopping around Goodwill Hunting to all these different studios, and everybody who read it said, "Well, you know, this is a great script." So the reason why they gave it to Weinstein was that uh, he he met with them and he said, "I love your script. It is great, but." I have one question. There was this strange gay sex scene between a Robin Williams character and the other guy's character. It was completely out of place. I have no idea what the story is there. And Matt Damon said, yeah, we just put that in there to see if people actually read the script or not. And you're the first studio to actually ask us about that. So, uh, so every now and then you have to put things into, you have to put things into the, uh, into the show to keep people awake and keep people going. Anyway, thank you all for the great work you do. And, uh, it does mean a lot to us. And, um, directly to the community. Thank you for the faith, patience, and support. Uh, I understand how hard these times have been, and believe it uh, believe it or not, it's much harder for us, because uh, you know we have 200 people at IOHK, and every single one of those people, we wake up every day, and we want to do a good job, and we want to deliver great products, and Cardano is the heart and soul of our company right now, uh, and it will continue to be for a long time, if not forever, just like Windows is the heart and soul of Microsoft. 
And so uh, nothing is, is going to be good enough until it's perfect for us. And we're going to keep striving towards that. And uh, I love this community. I love the support we've gotten. I've been to 52 countries in the past five years and uh, more than 30 plus for Cardano specifically. And I've met everybody from crazy people uh, to interesting people, colorful people that have our tattoo logoed uh, on their bodies. Uh, yeah, some people from Vietnam are very poor, but they're still supporters, people in Africa, to billionaires. And all along, it just amazes me uh, that this project has ignited so much passion and gotten a lot of people to dream again and think about all the things we could do and where we could go. Uh, so there's gonna be hard days. There are gonna continue being hard days. And no matter what we release, people are gonna be happy. Uh, people criticized the first iPhone. Uh, people criticized, uh, you know, all, all kinds of great films. Uh, and it is what it is. But you know, you don't look at the particular, you look at the trend. And uh, every fundamental of this project is very sound. And uh, we're moving in the great direction. And our industry as a whole is getting better. So thanks for the faith, thanks for the passion and support. And I'll see everybody next time, and I, I hope every time I keep coming on, we, uh, we keep having dialogues as fun and exciting as this. And thanks, David, for, for taking all the arrows in your back and you know, <laughs> be the product manager for this. It's not an easy job. No problem. Thank you, Charles. And thanks to the community for the support. All right. Thanks, everyone. Until the next episode of The Cardano Effect. Bye. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Rick. We'll talk to you soon.